you've got to have some mental fortitude and be able to fight through your own demons in the back of your head. Do they like me? Am I even going to get a shot? You know, all those things that as any normal human being goes through adversity and understands that the level of competition just stepped up dramatically. Mm -hmm. This guy wasn't the guy that recruited you. You had four dude or three high profile quarterbacks that they brought in that you're all now in a pool of competition. So every rep counted, every every time you stepped out on the field, what you did in the weight room, how you led was being evaluated, observed. And so there's stress that comes along with that. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit there and say that there weren't nights where I'm just up there turning in my bed and just tr trying to figure out where I stand in this lineup, right? But at the end of the day, it's like, okay, w the only thing that you can do is, and it takes you time, and especially for a young kid, is how do I go out and make myself better each and every day and not worry about everybody else? And I think that that's, for a lot of young athletes, including myself, that was the hardest thing to overcome mm -hmm. is, not worry about the situation or who got this rep right now. Instead, Just put your head down. What you can control. control what you can control. Welcome to the Matthews Mentality Podcast. In this episode, I have the privilege of getting to sit down with my longtime friend, former teammate, Matt Castle, Cast Dog. Cast dog, Do baby. Do people still call you cast dog? 100%. Okay, good. Yeah. Was that just a college thing, or did that translate into the NFL? Translated into the NFL, especially, you know, early on when you're a rookie, you don't want to go, you like, hey, <laughs> call me cast dog. Really. <laughs> but then as you as you start to build those bonds and relationships, I'm like, go ahead. Yeah, All right, cast so dog. I'm, I'm in the middle of, middle of your bio, but I'm going to stop, and I'm going to – breaking news. I don't know if you know this. Hmm. We haven't talked about this. So – in sports and athletics, like uh, amongst many things, jokes included, but a uh, nickname is a sign of endearment, affection, right? So almost everyone had a nickname. Oh, I, yeah. A couple months ago, I was actually thinking through our team at SCI. I was like, I don't know of anyone who didn't have a nickname, right? True. And do you, so my nickname, which started in college, is K Matt, right? Right. And everybody, even at the company to this day, calls you K Matt? Everybody calls me K Matt. And so I got a, I got a text um, over the weekend from two guys out in our Encino office, Mike Moreno, Rahul Chajet, who've been here for years. And they're like, man, every time they're like, somebody's like, oh, well, I know Kyle. And I always go, well, you, don't, you must not really know him because if you knew him, you call him K-Matt. Mm -hmm. So why am I sharing this story? Because you gave me that name. K-Matt, see that? I didn't even remember doing that. <laughs> no, we were, in yeah. the, we were in the gym uh, freshman year, like, you know, working out down in the dungeon. Yeah. And... I don't know how or why, but like you just looked over, you're like, come on, K Matt. <laughs> and then a couple of the guys on the team picked up, like, okay, oh, K Matt, all right. And yeah. that stuck, dude. You, you did it. You're welcome. Appreciate you're welcome. that. Yeah. You, you did know? not know that. Look at your I didn't know that, dude. Yeah. I was sitting there going, who gave you that name? Oh, yeah. I did. You did. K Matt, dog. Yeah. You, a, a influencer, life changer, cast dog. Yeah. Cast dog and K Matt. Title creator. Back together again. All right, NFL former NFL quarterback played 14 seasons with seven teams, including most notably the Patriots and the Chiefs, but also um, some other teams we'll, we'll, we'll lead into, including the Titans, which I think brought you here. Mm -hmm. In 2008, led the Patriots to 11 and five record. That was a year Brady got hurt. Yep, earned Pro Bowl honors with the Chiefs. Since retiring in the NFL, Matt has gone on to become a football analyst for NBC Sports. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, buddy. It's always great to see you. Cast dog. Let's go. What, all right, so what, what are what are you up to nowadays? Well, now I'm working with NBC doing college football. They approached me last year. I was doing NFL football once I got out, and I was at the Super Bowl, and I had a meeting, and they said, we now have the contract with the Big Ten. We're putting together a show, and we need some talent. Would you be interested? And so I went in, interviewed like three or four different times, and – all of a sudden, I got the phone call like, hey, we, we want to hire you. And I was pretty stoked about it. Now, it was a little bit intimidating at the same time because, one, wasn't from the Big Ten. But we knew that those teams from the Pac-12, after they dissolved, were coming in with USC, mm -hmm. UCLA, Washington, Oregon. But you think about the landscape of college football and really this new world we're living in with NIL, transfer portal, 130 teams. And so it's no, it no longer was that 32 teams that you're familiar with in the mm -hmm. NFL with the main players and all that. Every year is so dramatically different. I was about to ask, what is the biggest difference between broadcasting for an NFL 
um, network or an NFL show versus college? Is it just the the amount of information you have to kind of have a grasp of? It is because you kind of have to understand the complete landscape of college football because as as the season goes on, right, you're always talking about top 25. And now you got a 12-team playoff. In addition to that, you're talking about Heisman Trophy candidates, who the best in the country are. And then for specifically – Big Ten football, you know, traditions, coaches, players, and those rosters, as I said before, because of the transfer portal, they change dramatically every single year. Yeah. So there's a lot of work that goes into just having to grasp. This year, I'm so much further ahead of the curve because last year when I got it was pretty late. So I'm like reading all the literature, trying to figure out Scrambling. traditions. What are what are you? Because I'm an over preparer, right? That's mm -hmm. just hey, your quarterback. Yeah, you exactly. So a lot of the information wasn't something that you're ever going to use but you just wanted to always be prepared just in case but this year because of my familiarity with the actual conference itself and understanding the dynamics of each team and where they lie and new coaches and stuff i had more time to prepare and felt like i was more on it is year. college 12 or 18 this year college playoff i think it's eight right it's 12 is it 12 it's 12 teams which is I which mean, is awesome we got a shot uh, we've got a shot sc's got however a shot one of those spots go to a group of five school. Oh, so they're trying on. to be all inclusive. So even if that group of five school is outside that 12, then they get an automatic bid. Hmm. So you got I mean, let's not, let's not mess up anymore. At USC, okay? I know. Well, I just got back from the Michigan game. That was painful, but I, I like where the program's heading under Leak and Riley. hundred percent. So you have five kids and we'll, t we'll touch on that, but um, what is the, what is the travel work like? For your for your role at um, NBC. Well, the beautiful part about college football is it's 13 weeks, but I am committed to like I usually leave on a Thursday night, get in, go to production meetings, practice, do some maybe film some different stuff that's going to go in segments the next day, and then the following day we work because we've got the Peacock games too. So we don't just do the big game on the Saturday night. We'll have like this week we'll have two games prior to doing the main main game because we'll cover halftime pregame for the mm. 12 o'clock three o'clock and then we'll get into our but you don't have to be in two li different locations no I'm, right? no no i'm at the main game every week for wherever we're at so last week it was iowa at nebraska but we can still go on the field and shoot segments for those pregames so so you're living in nashville traveling on the weekends broadcasting um but from la right from LA, the Valley, the Valley, the eight one eight. You know a little bit about that. I, I did. I, I saw someone I hadn't seen in a while, and he's like, "Well, let me text you." And I was like, "Well, what number you got?" <clears throat> and he said, "Well, I got eight one eight. I was like, "Nah, man, I, <laughs> I, I put that in my we're really. few and far between, baby. When I see an eight one eight number, I'm like, "Yes, represent the Valley." Let's so, go. all right. So, from the San Fernando Valley, um, is it was it Chatsworth Chiefs? Is that I played for the Northridge Knights. Northridge Knights. Yeah, Northridge Knights was the Pop Warner team that I played for. We did have a chance for Chiefs because I was actually originally in like Granada Hills, Northridge area. Then we moved on right on that cusp, so I went to Chatsworth for high school. What was it like growing up in the Valley in the 90s? Oh, gosh, there's no phones. Nobody could get you in trouble for filming stuff. No social. No, the Thank Valley God. was uh, was great because our experience was probably a little bit different. When we moved to Granada Hills, we actually – believe it or not, was down in like the Beverly Hills area when we first in a small, like 3,000 square foot home. And then we moved out to Granada Hills. But my dad was from Lubbock, Texas. My mom from Cincinnati, met in Chicago, married in New York, moved to LA. So kind of crazy circumstance. Yeah. But my dad being a cowboy from Lubbock, Texas, because my grandfather was an Arabian horse breeder, we found this piece of property. It had probably 10 acres around it, but undeveloped land. So we had five horses, three dogs we had a different type of when you think of la it, it was but, but at that time in the west valley you could still kind of right. find a little bit of that yeah we'd go horseback riding every week and that's what we do we'd go on these two-hour horseback trail rides and stuff like that with up, my dad yeah up in so, the up in the mountains yeah up in the mountains so then um when i was about i want to say nine or ten we moved into like Northridge mm -hmm. and we got rid of the horses we did all that and so it became more were you born 82 born in 82 so you moved to Northridge in 92 93 something around there yeah something happened in uh, 94 right in Northridge yeah the epicenter baby that earthquake shook us all how was that that was insane I mean I remember the day like it was yesterday my brother and I were in like this little den area we fell asleep watching a movie things start to erupt 
at like 4 a.m. or mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. We ran into the kitchen, got underneath the table. At least we back then it was stop, drop, and roll. Stop, drop, Earthquake, and roll. get underneath the nuclear thing. war. Stop, yeah. drop, and roll. 100. percent Any, Anything, stop, drop, and roll, or get underneath the table. So we were in, in like plates are crashing, yeah. ceiling comes down. We had these little French doors. The water's like rushing into the house. I'm like, what is going on right now? Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden it stopped, and all you hear is just sirens going off all over, like all these car alarms and stuff like oh, that. Yeah. And then I'm hearing my dad, are you guys okay? You know, But our house was condemned. We lived in hotels for the next six months Jeez. while trying to figure out where to live because school was still going to go on. But the aftershocks and really the destruction that that created in that area was wild because there was a lot of people that lost their life. The mall, the Macy's Mall. Yeah. The top down. floor collapsed in the second. The 118 freeway. The 118 overpass. went down, and yeah, it was just it was an officer. It was a passed. wild time, man. I was in Mammoth. I mean, my where I was living at the time was probably 10 miles from there. Mm-hmm. But I just happened to be in Mammoth snowboarding that weekend, and um, so my family was in their house, and they said it was just wild. Obviously, it wasn't in Northridge, but again, probably 10 miles of Gore right. Hills, right? And I remember driving, trying to get home that because it was over. You know, whatever, like Martin Luther King weekend. Right, it was something like that. It was a long weekend. And so uh, driving back through the valley two days after, it was it was like a war zone. It was wild. I mean, people were sleeping in tents. Yeah, I mean, because there were so many of these homes that were were unlivable. And, and so they, and apartment buildings, like apartment a lot of buildings. the tuck under collapsed. Right. Um, right. It was it was a pretty bad situation. So there's it was you, two brothers? Two brothers and a younger sister. So I got an older brother, Jack. Younger brother Justin, and then Amanda's our uh, youngest sister. And what? A, how, how was that growing up? You know, was it a was it an intense house? Was it? Well, you've got three boys all within yeah. two years of each other. Strong personalities. Strong personalities. What it did is cre- created this environment of competition, and it was not that not that we didn't love each other, but we fought constantly. Oh, but yeah. it was over video games, right? If you're doing something, you run the same play over, you're cheating this, that, and the other, it fi- leads yeah. to a fist fight. Our one rule in our house was no hitting in the face. Dude, this is like the math yeah. is all we did was fight, but you weren't allowed to punch each other yeah. in the face. Body blows, totally Stomach, fine. Stomach, lower back was my, like a kidney shot. Oh yeah, was a good go-to. kidney shot was a good one, yeah. Or yeah. If, you, if, you, if you had the right shoes, you'd toke, you'd like, toe kick someone in the shin that Ooh, was a good one yeah that, that that hurts you know like when it hits yeah. that when that shin bone gets hit it, yeah. it sends a message you know? and when it's on it's on and then finally you both get so tired you're like yeah. okay <laughs> all right <laughs> uh, this is tough, you, you both go to your, yeah. your parents and blame he started it yeah and you they know? and usually the younger brother won out on that because you're like mm, yeah you're the older brother you should know better so what was the age difference between you and your older brother and younger brother so jack is about 18 months and then Jack and I, my older brother, and then my younger brother and I are probably about two years, so we're all pretty close in age. But y- you were, from a size perspective, I got the other end in my family, right? right. But um, you were pretty big compared to your brothers in terms of, you know, where you were for your age, right? So, well, believe it or not, Jack and I were similar in like height and stuff like that growing up, and then Jack had a growth spurt at like twelve. He looked like Jose Canseco. Like his forearm Jack. started to pop. Yeah, yeah, his forearm started to pop. He got these calves, and he became this man overnight. So I'm sitting there, and Stop that's when before, like, I hit puberty at like 14 years old. Yeah, he was like at puberty at 12. So this uh. guy just manhandled me for like three years. <laughs> that was good for you. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was great. It was great. Well, it builds, just uh, full DDT. What do they say? Builds character. It sure did. <laughs> so uh, what? What were you know? Sports, was that always a big part of your guys' life? I know your brothers have had a lot of success in baseball, obviously mm-hmm. with baseball and football. Right. Um, was that something that was was that something that was pushed in your family or was it just something you guys were kind of drawn to? It was something that probably we were more drawn to, but my dad didn't play college athletics. Like wanted to be a writer and an actor and stuff like that, which is interesting. Is that what brought then. him out to LA? That's what they brought That's him to LA. Oh, yeah. My mom's been a set decorator for the last thirty years in that industry so that's like they they were were in like the art industry right but my dad always had a passion and he was one of those hands-on fathers that we'd go out and if we ever had free time or weekends and stuff like that we're out playing ball and my mom was from cincinnati ohio so that's when the Bengals were pretty good my dad was from texas so the 90s was great for the dallas cowboys Cowboys. with aikman and irving and jay novacek emmett smith and that group so we just kind of gravitated to it and like i said before we always were very competitive with each other but we played rec league sports and we played all different types of sports and just 
from our love of the passion. It wasn't pushed on, by our parents by any means. It was more of this love and support for what we wanted to do, and that enhanced it. And you have to stay busy, right? And then staying busy with three boys, that was a big you part played, of it. You played football, baseball, basketball? A little bit of basketball, never much of a hooper. Played soccer as well. Soccer, yeah. Yeah, so I kind of played the whole realm. Yeah, like, the sports specialization seems to be, have become more of a thing in the last you know, 10, 20 years. I don't think that was something we did. I certainly did, and I played four sports. Heck no. I mean, and, and I, I see it now more as a parent with your kids coming up, right? where kids at a much younger age are specializing in one sport. They have their coaches on the side that are oh, teaching yeah. them, you know, specific things to get them better in yeah. an individual sport. And less and less of multi-sport athletes, but I think that it's it makes these kids less well-rounded. And the reason I say that is sometimes we just need a break, right? Yeah. If you put all your focus and everything year round onto one sport, yes, there are those kids that will excel and be so much further ahead because of the amount that they practice, the time mm -hmm. on task. But at the end of the day, I think even for some of the, like my older girls, they play primarily volleyball. But that relief of going into another sport, playing something different, being introduced to new faces and, and getting out of your comfort zone and also just saying, oh, well, let's go have fun. No pressure. Yeah, no, I agree. And <clears throat> th th to your point, there's value in repetition and drilling and especially in like what I call fundamental sports like a golf in a baseball where – you know, it, it the mechanics I would argue are more important than like a football. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there's also I think some science behind like your body developing athletic intuition with different sports and different movements, regardless of what you end up choosing to specialize in. But no specialization when you were a kid. No specialization. I just kind of played everything, and I, I think probably my my parents too. Part of it was let's get them out of the house, let's get the energy out because we were high energy household you know that's just you what we were. No, no i, could, not, I, could, not, I couldn't not imagine me. not me yeah i wake up ready to go baby depends on the day all right so i i thought i remember hearing this like because you and i were in the same recruiting class i remember i think i you and i i gave you a ride down to summer workouts before freshman year a couple of times but i remembered you as a obviously as a football player because we were coming in the same class but also as a really good baseball player do you play in the the world series team or something little league world series little so league that, world series. it's interesting you brought up the earthquake because in 1994 that year we had a stacked you had a squad league team and so we got out of like it was div divisions regional super regional and we went all the way to the uh, little league world series 17 and 0 this team was really good and then where's that in pennsylvania Yes, in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and we lose our first game to Connecticut, and we were like, what just happened? Like, we, we hadn't lost all year. We thought there's no way anybody would beat us. And then we rallied back, won the U.S. championship, played Venezuela in the world championship, lost 3-2. to two. But it was an incredible experience because— How old were you guys, like 11, 12? 12 years old. You were yeah. playing a bunch of 22-year-olds from Venezuela? Dude, I'm telling you, some of these guys had mustaches. Yeah. The, the dude on the bump, I think he was throwing 98. Yeah. Like, from the uh, equivalent was, to 98. What was the guy? Was it Cuba? Remember, like, when it kind of, the, the, the oh, racket yeah. came? What was his name? Um, he was just throwing heat, and nobody could hit him, and then they, and found, then they out. found out. he's actually 15. Yeah, he was, like, 15, yeah, 16. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Venezuela, uh, for sure. Venezuela, I was like, can we check birth certificates there, or how's this work? But it, it was... How it, was that experience? It was good? The experience was unbelievable because, one, you're just a kid, and you don't really... It's probably not until you're older that you really realize what that experience was because we went... And also, at the time, when the community was suffering, they had something to rally around. So when we came back from the World Series, we had a, parade. a full parade. Yeah, we went cool. on Jay Leno. We went on Letterman. We went... And we're on American Gladiators. We were there, like doing stuff at American Gladiators. Met, met, Laser. met Ronald Reagan. Oh, that's uh, cool. Met Bush. Met all these different people. And I'm sitting there going, "Where are we going today?" Oh, You're probably not. hamming it up. Oh, trying the to face I of mean, the franchise. I mean, it just was incredible to see the attention that this little game of baseball for one community, let alone for us to be able to go and have all these experiences. Like I said, as a kid, you're just not taking it all in. We were in the Rose Parade. We went down on the float in the Rose Parade. Of course, my fat ass, they made me walk the five miles where my buddy Matt Fisher's sitting there on the float. I'm like, come on, can I get on this float you, for a little were bit? Were you heavy as a kid? I was a little chubby. You know, they had a lot of pizza parties. I was big into pizza. Round table pizza used to crush. No, I don't. I, I mean, by the time you get to SC, I don't remember you as um, big, but not heavy. Let me. All right. So you, you're experiencing success, especially in baseball. Mm hmm. 
Was that just because you were just naturally gifted athletically, or, or were you, or is there some sort of like pre preparation and discipline that was going into it? You know, at the time, I can honestly say it was one of those situations where love the sport and just was a good player. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like I'd go out and work at it for sure. But when baseball season was over, guess what? I'm flipping the switch and okay, going right that, into the Yeah, that thing. was my question. So it wasn't one of those things that it was a year round um, adventure for me that I'm going and hitting lessons, this, that, and the other. I just kind of, I was blessed with some physical ability and was able to go out and play well. And, and that's just what it was. And it's harder to tell now kind of what we touched on with parents driving a lot of the, not just specialization, but the discipline of uh, preparation and, and drilling and all that. But um, I was wondering, <clears throat> as an 11, 12-year-old, whether it's baseball or football, were you a kid who was like, I am going to go be a professional athlete and that's all that matters and so therefore I'm going to dedicate my life to this? Or we, It sounds like maybe that might not have been you. It was just something that I did. You know? that like did. It was almost like when you go out and they say it's recess time. You're going to go out and play and I'm always going to play hard and have fun and compete. I love the aspect of competing. That's mm -hmm. something that was always ingrained in me, and that was probably a lot of growing up in the household that I did with my brothers, that everything was a competition, whether it was eating, whether it was swimming, just it could be the most mundane Who's activity. the most Who's the most competitive of you and you and your brothers and sister? I'd have to probably say that Justin, my youngest brother, and part of it is being the youngest guy, right? And that's probably why you see that study with most Olympians. Yeah. They're usually the number three, number four, because what do they have to do? They have to get they have to keep up with their older siblings and so justin has always had that edge of competitiveness he'll to him. take it to a lot where you're like dude what is happening he still to this day wants to wrestle and beat me up and he's now in all the classes and stuff like that where he goes and takes karate and ninjutsu classes i'm sitting there going okay no i'm not i'm not wrestling you anymore dude like i'm, yeah, I'm 42 on, like you're almost 40. but you know if you took all that jujitsu and you actually felt confident you could beat him you're like yeah let's 100 percent. yeah come 100 on. if i had a fighting advantage then yeah. there's no doubt i'd take him on yeah unfortunately my brothers are bigger but but i do do a lot of the mma so you know just in case just in case just you want to get a little wild yeah and in case they do Bring right it. like i'll put you in a room you still got choke. a big brother room every now and then every now and then yeah i got that old man strength yeah so um, the competition aspect of, you know, perhaps with three brothers, certainly, plus, you know, it's like you can't discount the sister, but um, that environment's going to lend itself to that. But was that something that um, your parents also fostered, you know? No, no, I wouldn't say that. I mean, and that was the interesting part. Everybody's like, what were you, what was your dad like? What was your mom like in terms of like, did they push you in a certain mm -hmm. direction? No, it was just their support factor. Like they were at all of our games. My dad would coach. And it was never coaching because he knew much about the game. It was more like just love for his kids. And my mom loved just keeping score there, yeah, cheering her. The cheering, right. My mom did that. You know, yeah. and they were competitive in their own right and they're in trying to be in their own industries and stuff like that. But in terms of sports, because it wasn't something that they grew up and they inherited that mentality of sports and that culture that we grew up in mm -hmm. and that they were it was more like just support them and whatever they have to do and even if i had a bad game hey maddie you played great you know you, you did great you this that and the other i was like no i sucked i went oh for four today like <laughs> whatever they it might be. Support. yeah they're probably it, trying to get you guys to compete less you know right and it was that it was just interesting because people ask me that a lot and with a lot of the people that we're exposed to later on in life especially as the competition level starts to stack up you get into high school and then in the college ranks and so forth and so on that a lot of these players that i've been around it was a different environment for them it was like well they they got pushed by their parents to go in a direction mm -hmm. they got pushed to to get to that certain level well i never felt that sense of urgency from my parents other than just full love and support and i think that there's something to that um well how would your teachers describe you as a kid um nuts probably disruptive. Um, I was one of those guys, as you probably know, a little bit of a class clown. Yeah, I love to make people laugh. Pranks. And really not good at understanding the environment that I'm in and that I'm not supposed to be talking right there. So too talkative, a lot of, a lot of misbehaving, spend a little time with the principal and the, and, the, and the dean and stuff like that just because I had to reel it in, reel it in. Yeah, just a lot of energy, you know, yeah. especially – as a young guy in a classroom setting where you, you know, structured learning isn't necessarily always yeah. conducive to those. Yeah. <laughs> that was me in the whole, wholeheartedly. When did you, when did you, um, 
become aware that sports in college and maybe maybe it was football first but again like i said i knew you were to be to be a really good baseball player like when did you say okay like i might actually be able to go play sports in college you know it was interesting because i went to the sc- high school that i did chatsworth high school had a great baseball program under coach museborn and so my initially when i went to high school i was just going to play baseball i've had a lot i had a lot of success as you know with the 12 year old mm-hmm. and then 13 year olds we went right back to the world series and then I started playing a little bit of travel baseball. I, and I played Pop Warner for three or four years. But then as I got a little bit bigger and all that stuff, I was like, well, I'll wait if I want to play. Then I was going by the football field one day when I, in my ninth grade year. They had already started, been in, and I wasn't even going to play. And I saw them. I was like, man, kind of got an itch. I want to want to go out and play, see if I'm going to play some football. Went out, talked to the coach. And he's like, well, there's this, this rule that you've got to wait two weeks, right, to, just to get yourself ready. So mm-hmm. – Wait two weeks, join the team. Third week, played middle linebacker and quarterback. So I mean, I, naturally, I, naturally, I played both ways, right? So I played middle linebacker, quarterback, and had some success. And then they pulled me up on varsity that year, like late in the season, As a freshman? just just to be part of that like wow. experience when they went. And then my sophomore year is really, I went out and I had a great baseball season. My freshman year, then I went out for the football team the next year, and that's when it, the light switch kind of came on mm. for me. Had a lot of success and played at a high level. And then I went out in baseball and had a, had a really good baseball season that year. And so I was like, I don't know what direction I want to go. But now that burning desire to go play football was there. And what was crazy about after that softball, I mean, sophomore season was that's when, you know, those guys started to show up at the doorstep. The college coaches. Yeah, and you start to yeah. get letters. And all of a sudden you're like this young kid yeah. going, wait. I didn't even know. Like, I, I it never went through my yeah. mind. You're like, why are they interested in me? Right. Yeah. And then you start talking to the coaches and this, that, and the other. And then that's really where it started to give me a focal point to say, okay, this is something that I, I might have a future in. And what, um, so did you start on varsity as a sophomore? Mm-hmm. And so that led into the junior year. When did you start receiving scholarship offers and for what sport? It was my junior year. So I was getting recruited for baseball and, I was getting the letters and all that stuff, but football had taken on a whole nother mm-hmm. realm, right? I'm getting phone calls from Tennessee, Miami, all these. They want me to come on official how, trips. Back now, nowadays, it, everything's so accessible, but like, how did they hear about you? Was it your coach would call the programs? Like, would they, would they just come by on a circuit? Like, they just stop by every high school? I think it was more something like that. And they say, come out to practice, check this guy out, watch a little bit of the film, mm-hmm. and then have a discussion afterwards. Because, like you said, it wasn't one of those things that I'd put together this video. No, that video. wasn't a thing. It wasn't a there thing. There were no websites right. that, I, was, that I'm aware of. No, there was magazines. Remember, you like, get ranked super in the prep. Ma- <laughs> super yeah, prep. Yeah. Super prep. And I don't know where they got their information from. Yeah, you'd from, see right? the name. You're like, oh, look at that. Oh, look at that guy. He's tw- really good. How do they know that? 27th safety in the <laughs> region. <you know? laughs> exactly. <laughs> the ranking system was hilarious. Uh-huh. But I just, it was just one of those situations where I think that they were in the area. They heard maybe that this kid might have some potential. Some people would come and say, hey, we would l- want you to come up and play safety. Like, they, we would like to recruit you as a safety. And I was like, dude, there's no chance I'm Not playing safety. Um, but, yeah, that's how it Anybody, all started. We, we see you as a tight end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Coach Carroll always had that vision for me. <laughs> I bet. So where, how did you – okay, by your, your junior year, um, what were the schools that you were kind of, like, narrowed it down, and how did you end up picking SC? Really, you know, because the, they had these recruiting days, at a, like USC, yeah, junior UCLA, day. junior day, yeah. where you get to go, they had, bring you out for a game, and then you get to meet the coaching staff, you're on the sideline. It's an, an amazing experience, especially when you haven't been exposed to that at all. I never mm-hmm. went to a college football game when I was younger. Like, I went to one and watched it because my grandfather was, went to Notre Dame, took us to Notre Dame, USC, which was awesome. But that yeah. was the only game I ever it. went to. that I didn't have any loyalties anywhere. So then going down to these big campuses, seeing these the stadiums packed, it just is like it's wild. It, it's so exciting, right? It, it really is one of those wow moments for you as a young kid. And then so I started getting recruited there. Then I came on an official visit to USC. And at the time, Carson had already started. And we thought he was maybe going to be three and done. I mean, the guy is as big, physically he talented. Was, he was like built in a factory. He was. He was your prototypical quarterback. quarterback that you're just sitting there going, oh, my gosh. Yeah, look at six, this guy. I mean, he might be 6'6", six, six, but like 6'5", six, athletic, strong arm. Great feet. I mean, incredible arm. Had the hair. 
Uh, yeah. Terrible dresser. Terrible dresser. Worst dresser I've ever. I met. don't know. I could probably be up there and. Uh, no, 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 <laughs> no. If you're dressed bad, it's because like you've chosen like consciously. I don't think Carson like. Carson could give to you he know doesn't, what? Yeah, he yeah. doesn't care. Which about that's anything. what makes him endearing to yeah. everybody that's ever around yeah, him. Yeah. Because not only does he not care what people think, he doesn't. He also is able to make fun at a, of himself yeah. and laugh at himself. Yeah. And those are two great qualities to still, have. Still, still wearing like his shark watch. Yeah, it's that's amazing. Not, and again, that's not even like a shtick. Like that's 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 CP. just as who the man is. That's right? CP man. Yeah, and so. Um, so then I started getting interested to get invited on these different visits. And I, when I went to USC, I was like, man, it's close to home. Mm-hmm. Coach Hackett was there at the time. Carson, I thought, was going to leave early. So red shirt, put myself into a position to where I can step in. Yeah. Red shirt, sophomore year, learn the system, do all that. And so I didn't even take another recruiting trip. I was like, all right. I, I think it was also just. Got caught up. Yeah, I got caught up and oh, I don't need to go anywhere else. I'm going to USC. Let's go. Yeah, there's a there's a peace of mind that comes when you make your decision. You mm-hmm. know, you're like, I don't even have to think about it because it is a it is a big decision, it's stressful. Mm-hmm. You know, so you you play your senior year, um, and then you head down to SC. What was that like? I mean, I think it's an adjustment for anybody that's leaving yeah. home for the first time. They put you in the dorms. That was brutal. Yeah, it was, in Cardinal Gardens. Cardinal Gardens wasn't that bad. No, we had a like nice... that was their new apartment complex. Now you go down there and you're like, dude, this is luxury. Who were your roommates your first year in oh, Cardinal Gardens? You, uh, you probably had three players, other players, right? No, I only had one. I had Alex. Uh, who's our tight end? Holmes. Holmes, dude. I had Alex Holmes. I'm sorry, Holmes, if you're listening to this well, podcast. No, hold I, up. That's the worst roommate in the world to have. Well, yeah, he uh he's an animal. He is an animal. He was. I think no, he he probably is a little bit more subdued now. But I think I back in the day he'd stay up all night long. He'd rage. Yeah, no. I, I mean know. he was an he was absolute, our t- he was like our top recruiter. Yeah, oh a hundred percent. He yeah. had the inside access going to Harvard Westlake to yeah. sunset. Yeah. Which is like he'd get you into any club at any time. A-hole. And, a hole, that yeah. was that my, was a very fitting name too. My uh, room, my roommates, my freshman year, Jason Leach, uh, Kenichu Desi, and Jamal Williams. Like we were in the same little spot in Cardinal Garden. So that's that, amazing. It was an adjustment. Yeah, coming from Agora Hills, a hundred percent. It was, it was uh, yeah, I won't say the most fun, but it was probably up there with the most fun I've ever had. Like, well, you, you're finally independent, and you can kind of make decisions for yourself. Yeah. But also, the beautiful part about sports and being on a team is it gives you structure. It gives you structure, and it gives you. Uh, Gives you a tribe right away while, you know, yeah, that's what fraternities and sororities are to a degree, I think. Right, but 100%. Like, we were, we had our tribe, you know, before school even started. So you, you didn't have that kind of wandering or loneliness. I think some freshmen where they're like, how do I fit in here? Right, because you're already out there grinding, creating that brotherhood and the connections. And you have usually your class that comes in with you that you're really tight with. Mm-hmm. Like our class, we had a really tight class, yeah. but you build those bonds. And then from there, you get in with the team. And as long as you're out there working hard and doing what you need to do, you start to slowly but surely build this big tribe of people that mm-hmm. that really gives you that support system that you're going to need as, as you play sports and go through adversity. Your, your freshman year, you, you know, you had said an adjustment outside of Holmes as your oh roommate. Uh, what, what, were, what was or what were some of the biggest adjustments you had to make? Well, I, when I came in, there was Carson Palmer, obviously the number one. Then Mike Van Rapp. Van Rapp. Van Rapp. He is, was, he was is, cool. He's the greatest and really smart and he, and all that stuff. So I. But that two, was that was it, right? That, that was it, yeah. and then me, and so we. It was one of those where those guys had been there. They've been through some battles. Mm-hmm. They know what to be, and and kind of taught me how to study. At the same time, taught me how to be a good leader. Like I just more observe and try to fall into line, and so. I had great leadership, great mentorship from that position. But at the same time, it's me trying to get caught up to speed. This game that we played in high school. There's levels to it. Where I'm the quarterback and probably the biggest kid on the team. You know, I had probably some offensive linemen that were much smaller, smaller than I were. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you go out to that first blitz drill and your eyes are about this big and you're sitting there going, oh, man, this is a different level. With some big humans. I took my son down on the sideline for the game two days ago, Michi- yeah. Michigan SC, and – I think he's, man, dad, these guys are pretty big. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're big. It's and, different. And it's an intimidating environment. And they get bigger. Yeah, like, and they get at bigger. The next level. Yeah. And, you're, and I think you're also trying to find your way. Like, where do I fit in? How do I become the best player? Because you don't really know, right? You're going down there. 
you're lifting weights, you're going to school, but then you're coming into practice, you're running scout team, mm -hmm. you're saying, okay, but how do I get to the next level? And I think that that's always the challenge because there's that mental anxiety that comes with, am I good enough to do it at this yeah. level? Can I play at this level? And at the same time, how do I put myself in that were you, position? Were you running on the black shirts, your red shirt year, running mm -hmm. scout team? How, how, was, how was that going from being a star quarterback to being, you know, on the scout team? Yeah, you know, I think for me, I knew I was going to have to pay my dues. And that's one of the reasons I came to USC was I knew I was going to say, okay, I want a red shirt and put myself in a position to adapt to what the college game is. And the nice part about for the quarterbacks, right, I would still go to the games, be there on the sideline, you know, take it. Mental written, reps. Mental reps yeah. to a certain degree. Well, I was going to say it sounds like, not that it was this structured, but it was you being on the scout team was actually part of the plan in a, in a way. So you, you probably weren't sweating it. Um, right. I, I wasn't one of a kid expecting to come in yeah. and start right away. I knew what I was coming into. Yeah. I knew that there were two guys in front of me, but I also knew Carson was going into his redshirt sophomore. Yeah, redshirt sophomore year. Oh, well, he hadn't redshirted yet. Maybe he did, right? Well, that was when he broke his collarbone against mm -hmm. Oregon the year before that yeah. set him back, right? So I, I just had no real stress about going on, getting on the field early. My whole purpose was to go learn, to absorb, to make myself – as good of a player as when for when my time came Physically to compete. Physically developed. Yeah, you. and that's a big part of it too. Yeah, for that work, jump though. that you make when you get in that weight room from the time you step onto that campus, just from year one to oh, year two, wild. you come in as a boy Yeah, in so many different ways, right? Mentally, physically, but really that jump that you make and the hard work that you invest, that all of a sudden you start to see the strength gains, you start to understand how to work, what it's going to take to play at this yeah. level. Yeah, I came in at... <laughs> I came in at like 172, not even kidding. Like 6'2", <laughs> 172. I think, you know, I, was, I probably wore weights in my shorts when I was on the scale. Like, well, for Jamie? Jamie yeah, Yancher yeah, sitting yeah, there? Yeah, Jamie Yancher with those crazy eyes. But, um, yeah, I left there at like 215. Did but you like, really? But like yeah. really muscular and then huh. sat in a chair for 18 years making cold calls. Like the, the composition slowly it, changed. It, it but slowly no. changed. But, yeah, that first year is wild, like the, the transformation in your body. Because, mm -hmm. um, like, you know, especially back then, there weren't weight programs. I think we'd like bench. You yeah, know? we'd bench. We'd do a little bit of this here, here and there. But once you get there and they put you on that program and you're four days a week and they're pushing you mm -hmm. to your physical limits and you're running. And then running. you got to go out and practice. And then you got to go out and practice and you've already thrown up at 5 30 yeah. in the morning from the run. Well, and going, from the from the booze the night before but yeah, yeah sometimes <laughs> yeah that, that was definitely that was no, but, that but was sometimes harder to the overcome run. than the actual run all right so hit a little history lesson for the um the audience so our freshman year we did not do well and uh coach hackett got uh, let go towards the end of that season mm -hmm. and um all of a sudden they hire some guy that n no, none of us had ever heard of a guy named pete carroll what was um what was your experience uh like through that kind of time of Coach Hackett, which is the guy you committed to. Right. And, and and in the quarterback room, you tend to have a special relationship with the coach, especially right. the head coach. And then a guy like Pete Carroll comes in. What was your first interaction with him? You know, I, I went up, and he was walking through, actually. I think this was the interview process before they even announced him. And they introduced me. He's like, hey, Maddie. He calls me Maddie right away, right? Yeah. The only people that call me Maddie are really my mom yeah. and Coach Carroll. Right. And so he's, so Matt, good. he's, he's good just so people. energetic, yeah. charismatic, and he, he, yeah. oh, charismatic, energetic. You just gravitate to his personality. I was like, wow, this guy has is a ball of energy, yeah. excitable, wants, wants whatever's best for Infectious the program. Infectious enthusiasm. Uh, that's a great way to put exactly what Pete Carroll is. And you felt that from mm -hmm. day one. Absolutely. And then all of a sudden he came in and he took the job. And, you know, you do some reading up. I mean, this guy had coached for a long period of time. Yeah, he had a lot of success. Head coach. I mean, even in New England, where he got fired from, I mean, they I, were playing in the playoffs. I think two out of the three years. Right. It just, it just happened to come after Parcells, which was tough. And before Belichick, which, you know. Yeah, it, he, he was kind of sandwiched in there. But I knew that he was hungry, right? And he wanted to prove something. And so this was just the perfect environment for him to come into at the time. And you think about that personality that he has. It was – a perfect fit for college students and where we were as a program and because we had a lot of talent mm -hmm. now it just needed to be nurtured brought together and go for the the same purpose that we i mean work to the common goal that we are all wanting to work to and i think that first year we went through our own struggles with him as well we but started it, one in five 
we weren't very good. And then we remember yeah. we went to Las Vegas Bowl that year. We were six and six, played the Utes and got drummed in the, by the Utes. Negative, but, negative two yards rushing. But that was a great bowl. It was, it was a great a bowl. bowl. Xbox. We, we got the best swag that bowl. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling yeah. you. Yeah. And the per diem was great. Oh, yeah. And then if, you know, you you have a little bit of a fake ID. Yeah, you're like, I mean, man, you're this, in the casino after. It, this bowl it, it made the sting go away a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it did. But our defense got better. We got better throughout the – you could tell we were getting better. We were getting tougher. We just were missing like a couple players in a couple positions, and obviously on the recruiting side, he did a great job. So speaking of recruiting, um, Pete Carroll's like, probably his first year he goes out and recruits a quarterback from modern day, Matt Liner. Mm -hmm. And how was that? Like, I have my own experiences with like Polamalu, right. Darnell Bing, you know, but um, who's a great guy? Uh, but you know, it's it's such a unique industry, if I may call it that, where like you're consciously aware of the coaching staff actively, you know, going out and looking, and I don't want to say you're a replacement, but like actively soliciting and recruiting your competition to come in and, and right. effectively try and beat you out. And Pete was very, he was very um, public about that. I, I, I don't know if you remember this. He sat us down and we had to watch the highlights of the recruiting class that he just recruited. Guy, guys, these guys right. are coming in to take your job. They're <laughs> going to get a look in the fall. So it was spring. He's like, it's spring practice. Matt, Kyle, this is your chance. Because in the fall, these guys are coming in. They're really good, and they're here to take your jobs. And, oh, by the way, you're going to watch their highlights right now. Yeah, it's a humbling and stressful environment, you know, because yeah. the year that Pete came in, he brought Lineart, he brought Billy Hart, and he also brought in Brandon Hans, who played the year That's before right, at, at Purdue. Purdue. Gosh, And yeah. this guy – Played well, Brandon. Yeah, I remember B. that. Hans played well because we saw his highlights. Yeah, we saw his highlights, know. and I'm going. If I remember correctly, Dang, it, coach. Was, it was almost like Hans was the was like the get where it's like, oh, this guy's transferring, and it's not that Liner wasn't. He was like a pretty big recruit, but he wasn't like Carson coming out of high school, where right. it's like like he was going to be one of the guys competing. How how is that on you mentally when Pete's like, hey, what's up, Maddie? And then he brings in three guys to effectively, you yeah. know, try and beat you out. Yeah, it, it, it's tough mentally. Like, you've got to have some mental fortitude and be able to fight through your own demons in the back of your head. Do they like me? Am I even going to get a shot? You know, all those things that as any normal human being goes through adversity and understands that the level of competition just stepped up dramatically. Mm -hmm. This guy wasn't the guy that recruited you. You had four dude or three high profile quarterbacks that they brought in that you're all now in a pool of competition. So every rep counted, every every time you stepped out on the field, what you did in the weight room, how you led was being evaluated, observed. And so there's stress that comes along with that. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit there and say that there weren't nights where I'm just up there turning in my bed and just tr trying to figure out where I stand in this lineup, right? But at the end of the day, it's like, okay, w the only thing that you can do is, and it takes you time, and especially for a young kid, is how do I go out and make myself better each and every day and not worry about everybody else? And I think that that's, for a lot of young athletes, including myself, that was the hardest thing to overcome mm -hmm. is, not worry about the situation or who got this rep right now. Instead, Just put your head down. What you can control. control what you can control. And that's the toughest thing well, for that's what I was going to ask. Like, did you find yourself at times, like, kind of what I, what we call here, what I call like victim mentality? Like, somebody's doing something to me. Like, it, I, you know, just, I wasn't their recruit. I was Hackett's and, you know, like, this isn't fair. And again, maybe even before the decision of ultimately who they decided to, follow Carson with with Leinart but like again you had two years where again Carson you know Pete's first year and then he naturally came back and then he balled out and it was his time to go anyway he won the Heisman but for two years you're effectively in competition to see who's going to succeed this guy there had to have been some moments where you thought of transferring and thought of um you know just like woe is me that you know this isn't my fault they're you know they're doing this to me like it must have been tough. It's easy to go down that rabbit hole, right? I mean, especially it, as like 19, 20 a, years old. Because you're so, especially when you're in the college football ranks, because, you know, you're so impacted day to day by what that coach says to you, by how, how that practice went. That rep, those five reps that you go, you know, you might have messed up a check or something like that. And that, the, that sticks with you for that entire day because you're like, gosh, how does that reflect on me? How mm -hmm. does he think of me? And how, what's the perception now? of me as a quarterback so there absolutely was that and then it's like well why didn't I get as many reps today as he did or something like that the thing about it though 
I maintained my was I was a second string quarterback throughout Carson's tenure. Mm -hmm. So I was always felt like I was on the cusp. But at the same time, I knew ultimately it was going to not come down to whether or not you were the backup quarterback during his tenure. It was going to be, hey, you get a spring ball to go prove yourself. Well, that's what I was going to ask. What was in that in that time period and then maybe after Carson left, but there was spring. What was the like the highest high? What was the moment where you were just I'm going to win this thing? And then maybe what was the the low point could have been a bad scrimmage or whatever, like where you're like, oh, no, like this isn't going well. I think a big part for me was I went through uh, that spring and felt really good. Like I was ripping the ball around and everything. And so Coach Chow called me in and we were going on spring break, calls me into his office by himself, says, Matty, just want to let you know you're doing a great job. But this next thing I'm going to tell you, if you tell anybody outside this room, I'll deny it. I was like, oh, this is interesting. What exactly is he? He's like, you're going to be our star going into camp this year. And so I was, you know, I gave him a hug, left that feeling good. Oh, yeah. Came back. We hadn't even had a practice. And I, he calls me back into his office to say, hey, I think it would be best if we leave the competition open. It will get the better out of both of you. And I was like, what is yeah. going on right now? Like, you can, you said this right before we left. We haven't even had – but now you're opening back up. Not that he wasn't going to open up competition. Like, there's still a long way to go. But they're going from high of a high – to a low yeah. of a low point of going once again second guessing yourself mismanaged expectations yeah, 100%. If, amongst many things and and you you know you could argue competi open competition is good it will make you and Matt better but also Liner but also there is a and I'll speak from a defensive player's perspective there was some I don't want to say confusion there was some like it was just hanging over the team I remember that it was just like cause yeah. we, we didn't know who the starter was and as important as us defense, defensive players love to think we are, we know like you only go as far as you know your quarterback. And I remember thinking like, man, like how have they not decided? Like they've had yeah. these guys for two years, right. you know. But um, and so all right, so that that yeah, that must have been pretty brutal. And so you go into fall camp. I now I don't remember this. When did they make a decision? Dude, literally a week before that first Auburn game. So I get called into Pete's office, and I didn't know what which direction he was going to go. And he calls me and says, Matty, you did an unbelievable job. This has been the hardest decision that we've had to make. Um, but we're going to go with Liney in this first game. And if for whatever reason he falters or struggles, you're in. That's what he says to me. And so – Did you stomach like just drop? Just drop. As soon as he said it, I was just sitting there. I was devastated. Yeah. You know, you, you go through so much hard work to get to this opportunity and you know that this is your shot or hope that it's your shot. And we were a talented team too. If you, yeah. if like as a quarterback, you were about to say, Kyle, if you played quarterback at I SC, mean, I, I was just saying, <laughs> like know. you felt like you could have some success with yeah. the team that we had. I right? could throw some checkdowns, right? And so when he said that, I just remember walking out, and I actually had to go to a quarterback meeting, and I'm just sitting there, just kind of silent and trying to take it all in and gather my thoughts, and also who I wanted to be in that moment because it's easy to go the other way and just, you know, I've been around those guys that when that type of that type of message was sent to you and you're, you're told, hey, you're not the starter, that they go, they're a shell of themselves. They that know, was me. Yeah, I mean, and it's, it's hard to grasp yeah. that, especially, like you said, because you've been working for that opportunity and then to be told somebody else just jumped you. It was. Uh, it took some time for me to get over that because, and again, at the same time, rally yourself to say, "Hey, maybe, he, maybe he's not ready, and I've got to be ready to go." Yeah. In. You know, but that's no. You, you have those moments, but certainly you're like, "This is a good team. Like, it, it's going to be hard. I don't want to say hard to mess it up, but like, with Mike Williams and Kerry, I saw Mike this weekend with Kerry Colbert and and that a line we had. I mean, it was just it was going to be." Yeah, you know, if it didn't happen that first game, it, it was probably not going to happen. Right, because at the time, Auburn was ranked, like, number one preseason they were, polls. Yeah, they, and they and by the way, talented. Their, their talent was incredible. Their coaching schemes were not, and we knew that on defense. Like, we knew that they had never seen a zone blitz. Oh, yeah. we, I think we sacked them nine times, <laughs> and we beat them, what, 24 nothing. But, yeah, you know, it was uh, before my senior season, so it was because um, I sat behind Troy for three years, which is understandable, and I had a lot of – I had a lot of growth I needed to, right? You know, physically. But um, by my fourth year, you know, I was six one, six two, like two ten, two fifteen, and I was, I, I understood the defense, and I in my head I was like, okay, this is my season. And uh, they recruited Darnell Bing, five star, which you know came in who's six three, two twenty, and sweetheart guy, like great player. There's nothing 
I could say about the guy. And right. It, it, just, it almost made it harder because he was such a good person, you know. Right. But Pete's like, hey, it's a, you know, we have history with you. We brought in this guy. We'll, you know, let you guys compete. And I thought, you know, just from a grading scale, because they graded us in scores, right. I thought, I thought that I did more than enough. And Pete sat me down, oh, two weeks before Auburn or a week before Auburn. Was like, hey, we're gonna go with this guy. I did the opposite of you, so credit to you. I developed a very bad attitude. I was a victim. I was being screwed. And resentful. I just, resentful. F this, F these guys, F this program, which did not work out for me, it turns out, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, but it actually was a blessing because it, it, I learned so much from making a bad decision that any time in my real estate career things didn't go the way I wanted, I actually, well, this is on me. I have to, right. I, whether I l agree with the decision or not, I have to find a way around this or through it or overcome it. But at th that time, at 21, 22, I was not mature enough the way... Because you handled it well, I remember. It was, it but was you kind of fake it till you, you know, till you can't type <laughs> deal, right? You, you go in, you put on the good face. You're still a good you're teammate, but you're, you're uh, there's in the back of your mind, and if we're being real with each yeah. other, everybody want to say, "Well, f you, I f can't you. believe yeah. you just went that." Like now, a hypothetical question. I don't know if you've been asked this. If the transfer portal was in effect back then, the way it is now, would you have stuck around? I probably would not have. Yeah. To be honest, I mean, I, I think about that, and I've been posed that question before. Oh, yeah, okay. And But part of it is simply now with the ability to go transfer, not sit out a year, because that was my catch-22. Like, oh, wait, I have to transfer and sit, sit out. out. And if it was in the Pac-10, you had to sit out two, two years. years. So there's no chance doing yeah. that. So then you're going to go to another school with no guarantees, and you're a year removed yeah. from like actually being able to compete, which doesn't mean that they're not going to go recruit guys along the way. And then you're yeah. gonna, for one season, too. And that's the other part of it is a lot of coaches didn't want to commit to a guy that they have for one year. Did you have any of those conversations like with coaching staff or is it like just between you and your parents? Like, what should I do? Yeah, I think that that was probably more with my my family, yeah. you know, people that I trusted, my coach from high school, all those guys. And at the end of the day, I was going to graduate in four years so I was on the path to graduate I knew that at this point didn't know didn't think that probably football was going to be in my path but you had a good degree and, and get a good degree I'm live in California set myself up for something different getting a commercial real estate yeah <laughs> come work for you no um so did they ever tell you what it was that they wanted to see more from you or like no I think that was the frustrating part same you know they, it was never so like vague. there was one defined moment that separated you it was just guess what we're going with him but yeah. never like right. the what? but why yeah why I, what did i do wrong where where do you see I, me what, where, where's again, the certainly not to the magnitude yeah. or level of yours but I, that was the same thing is like uh but, but what, what where did i mess up like right. oh kyle we don't trust you and cover to you you you're too aggressive against the run and that's a defense that we run a lot no it was not it was like and you're like, I, well, I don't even know how to process this because I don't know what you base your decision off of and how would I get better? Not that I have time to do that, but when when did you... <laughs> yeah, I'm See, this there. is where my memory is hazy. When did you switch to tight end? Dude, midway through that year. So I'm the backup quarterback. And then we had some injuries. Like, I think Bird went down. Somebody else got banged up. And so Coach Carroll comes up to me about midway through that year and says, hey, Maddie." Uh, we got some injuries at tight end, and would you be willing to, you know, make make that position change? And at the time, I was so frustrated. Yeah, I, was I was just sitting there doing yeah, nothing. Yeah. I was like, "Screw it, yeah, I'll go fucking play tight end. I can do this." Well, you're six five. What were you? Probably two forty at the time. I I was probably t played at quarterback even at two thirty, but yeah. I put on like within. I could put on weight pretty easily yeah. with a few of those Jamie protein shakes. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Carlisle and those guys would just put those. So good. So I just was like, "All right, I'll do it now." I told you I was telling you the story at breakfast, but I, I soon regretted that decision when I went out and we're doing nine on seven, which is a run drill, right? It's yeah. it's only box drill. So I'm at the end of the line of scrimmage. Kenichi Udaisy, who, if you don't know him, was a first rounder, went to Minnesota, stud player, massive human. Six four, two eighty five, shredded. Yeah. And so we've got an outside zone, and that means I can lean on the tackle a little bit. We move him out of the way. But I'm not doing anything, but I love to talk smack to my boys, right? So I'm talking smack yeah. to them, like, you just got blocked by a quarterback. Then they call a draw, play, next play. He fires out to hit me, but I'm working up to the second level, so I just kind of sideswipe him. He lands on his face, and now he's hot. And, of course, Ogeron, being the wonderful human that he oh, is, uh, yep. calls the outside zone to the right. I'm the backside cutoff. Who do I have to cut off? 
Kenichi Udaisy. So he decides to pick me up. Literally does not care where the ball is. No, he's so strong. Didn't care about the gap scheme. Picked me up, drove me back 10 yards, body slammed me. And it's like, how you like that, bitch? Yeah. I was like, okay, this is this sucks. And yeah. then he, and then just going into the meetings alone, I just was like, what are we doing? We went into meetings and we're just watching box boxes, right? Yeah. Four down, three linebackers, where we were always big picture at the quarterback position, you like watching everything. But we're watching a bunch of run drills, blitz blitz drills, how we're going to pick up this, how we're going to sift the double teams and all that. I was like, gosh, this is so far. How long removed. did you how so you're within, you know, it's August of 20 2002 or 3 and um probably 2003 um uh, and you you're battling to be the starting quarterback of, you know, what eventually became the number 1 team and now you're backup tight end. Yeah. You, there was something to just there was something to me getting out on the field that just felt good that gave me a little reprieve from all the the, the aggravation yeah the aggravation and the resentment and all those things of just kind of going out and actually getting on the field for the first time I'd been waiting I've been grinding never got to get on the field other than some mop up backup mm -hmm. duty so there was part of that that I was like you know what I'm just gonna embrace the moment for what it is. I'm going to go out, do my best. I caught a few balls. I played on special teams. Like, And at that point, I just wanted to be a contributor in some capacity because it's great. Look, we're winning at a high clip doing all those things. But to be on the team and just say I contributed in yeah, some capacity it's, versus, it's, you know, when you go and everybody's celebrating, you yeah, feel you're good. Like, you're like, but you're like that man, was did great, I really, but I didn't yeah. really do anything. And you can say, like, yeah, well, we helped you get ready. And, and but there no, it's is different when you're on part the field. of that. But it was just a little bit different, and I needed that at that moment, just anything to release some of that frustration and tension. That and blowing up, uh, I was telling the story. So we have this, uh, <laughs> we have a buddy, we have a buddy we play with, Matt Lemus, if he's uh, listening, Big L. Um, you know, smaller guy, you know. Um, the squirrel. The squirrel. And he was your roommate, and I remember I was telling Matt this story at breakfast, and you, you like three seconds in, you're like, I know what you're going to say. I know exactly what you're so, going to say. But you were, you were taking a rep at quarterback, and he had a yellow jersey on. So at SC, if you had a yellow jersey quarterback, you couldn't tackle, you couldn't touch. But this was a full pad drill. Um, it was a scrimmage at the Coliseum. It was a scrimmage at the Coliseum, jeez. <laughs> so, like, everyone's parents are there. There's probably 10,000 people in the stands. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. And you, you're at quarterback. You take a drop. I don't know if it was, like, a – uh, called boot or you, you break the pocket to your right you're very mobile for a guy your size yeah. and lemos matt's coming up and he sees castle he's in the yellow jersey so he goes to like you, you know the quarterback you kind of like touch off you know right. you kind of give him like a tap because you cannot hit the quarterback you know with starter backup it doesn't matter and so lemos poor guy he's, he's coming up to like stand there like up. this he's, i'm running full speed Matt's running full speed and lemos is like well you know i'm gonna touch him up i'm not gonna tackle him he's not gonna hit me and you lowered your shoulder in this guy. And so <laughs> Lemos is probably like 5'10", 180 at the time. You're 6'5", 240. And it just destroyed him. Now, it was on the goal line. It was. I, I just got caught in the moment, <laughs> man. I, I was like, I, and, I, and I remember Lemos oh. like was he was. I mean, it was a it was a it was a car crash. It was a collision. <laughs> and he gets up like, what the fuck, Castle? Like, and we were just like, all the defensive guys like, you dick. And like, I'm jumping up. I'm like, yeah. And I was like. And Lemos is like, what the fuck, Castle? I'm like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Shoot, I forgot we were not live uh, at all. And then you had a yellow to, jersey You had to go home after. He's your roommate. Oh, just sit there he was, like, he's still mad to this day. Every time I see him, he's like, dude, why did you do that? And I was like, <laughs> honestly, you, you, you were going through I blacked out. I blacked out. I, blacked out. Yeah. I, you know, I, thought, I thought me earning my spot was me running you over, yeah. even though I had a yellow jersey well, at might, the goal line. It might have helped. Um, all right, so you – you in some way process like liner obviously goes on to have a great season and your red shirt senior year he won the heisman right yeah it was my red shirt no he won the heisman that year didn't he and then reggie won it the next year our uh red no shirt. i think i think he won maybe it. it was vice versa anyway so at what point i want to kind of move the story along where it's like you're at sc it's just like okay it's not going to happen here for me was there a moment where you said, you know, you touched on it earlier, but I want to make sure I answer this question, ask this question well. When did you say, like, I, there must have been, like, a, a debate where you're like, should I even try out for the NFL? Or, like, because I didn't play. Like, should I just move on with my life, take my degree, get into something good? Or, like, 
I guess I'll go out and try out. Like, what was that process like? And what ultimately led you to the decision to go for it? I think the best thing that ever happened to me was after that year, I was so frustrated because just like you said, I was at a crossroads. I was like, do I continue down this path? I mean, I was going to finish my career, right? Because I wasn't yeah. going to ever just stop playing and, and quit on anything. But that spring going into the, my senior year, I went and played baseball. I don't know if you remember that. I, re I do remember that. Yeah. And that was the greatest reset that Why? ever could have happened. Why? Because, you know, you as we talked about before, everything was so primarily focused on this one thing in your life that you held so dear and important to you and you felt like it kind of it molded you into who you were so your existence was the quarter you got to be the starting quarterback at USC and that's when I kind of threw my hands up and said this isn't going to happen right so I have to make a decision what I want to do and I went and played baseball and I said I hadn't played baseball since high school and Gillespie I said hey coach I, I know you recruited me we have a good relationship if I can help this team, like I'm a free scholarship, would you allow me to potentially walk on? Like, and you get get me for free. And he's like, well, let's throw it. What do you want to do? And I was like, I haven't hit in a while. So I was like, let, let me pitch. So I went out through a bullpen and he's like, yeah, I think we could use you. And you're like, come on out. So then how, all those, how did the football coaches take it? I didn't care because it was either that or banging my head in spring and being frustrated yeah, and doing yeah. all that. So what it did was took my mind away from everything that had gone on in um, football for the four previous years. Mm -hmm. The frustration, the letdown of not being named the guy, the, all that stuff that led up to that. Kind of freed you, right? It freed me, right? It just changed your mindset. And I went out and I had a blast. We went to Cuba for the game, like the first tournament of the year, we went to Cuba. And it was the coolest thing. We were down there for a week. We stayed in Havana, played in all these different provinces, built new just relationships. Just hanging with the baseball bros. Hanging with, and baseball is so, much, so different, right? Those guys, man, like, they would come down to the to the workout room. They'd do some bicep curls. They had a dip in their mouth half the time. Yeah, you know, 100%. So. I mean, it's just a different environment. You hang out in the bullpen. Yeah. You go out, you know. It's you, totally different. Middle relief. But it was the best thing was it was just getting my mind off of football. Yeah. Right. And going out and say, there's more to it. Right. And I had a blast. Had fun. had fun. And then I know that coming back into that. Right. Pete was going to probably want me to play tight end. So I went in and at this point I had the effort mentality. Yeah. And that was the best thing for me. Yeah. Right. Because I cared so much before that about every day, about what this coach thought, about who was in front of me, who wasn't in front of me, you know, what the reps were. And then I said, F it. I yeah. don't care. Like, I'm just going to go out and play. And I told Coach Carroll, I said, hey, look, I know you want me to play tight end, but I want to finish this thing how I started. I want to play a quarterback. So I come in first day, depth chart shows up. I'm last on the depth chart. I don't give a shit. I don't care. Great. Like, I, you know, I might go play baseball again this year. Who knows what happens? Like, I got drafted all on potential. Yeah. Not on, yeah. Not on anything that I did well on the field, right, just because of the size and all that stuff. So go out, and I just was like, every day, I just kind of enjoyed it, and I said, look, I'm going to let the chips fall where they may. I threw the ball well, did all that. I was going to say, did you find you were uh, almost a better player? I did, because yeah. that mentality of not caring so much about what everybody else thinks and just saying, I'm going to go out and have fun, enjoy it, let it, let it fall where it may, take the pressure off of yourself. Then all of a sudden I started like climbing the ranks, and then all of a sudden by the end of that uh, – summer camp and pr part of it was jd booty he read they finally redshirted him yeah i remember that so i stepped yeah. in and i was the number two well we blew out a lot of teams that year i got a lot of playing time i was able to show and throw throw the ball around enough yeah enough to where i was like man i, I mean i feel like i've got a skill set here but i just haven't had the opportunity so then i knew the draft was coming up and they had um the pro day or whatever i wasn't gonna go to the combine but i went in i remember carl smith remember carl smith yeah so I go into Carl Smith and I said, "Hey, Coach, I think um, I'm going to go out for this pro day." He's like, "Cass, I think you want to maybe look for a different profession at this point." Yeah, you're right. I said, "Screw you, Coach!" Right? Oh, yeah. And again, it went back to the effort mentality. I don't care. I don't need your approval. I'm just going to go out and show up. And I went out, trained my ass off for for pro day. Was throwing the ball great. Have you seen Coach Smith since then? Oh, I still talk to him. I was going to say, yeah, you, I still you talk hang to him on every, to every time. Yeah, right, good, good. You go, go get a different profession, yeah. huh, Coach? Um, hold hold on to a grudge as long as it serves you. Yeah, know? yeah, you know, a little bit of little bit of motivation yeah. here and there. And so then pro you had day a good came, pro day, good pro day. I threw the heck out of the ball, 
And so, and obviously, I benefited from the fact that we had such an outstanding group of talent I coming mean, out. Yeah, geez, how many people were there that year? Like everyone. Right? It was uh, everyone, and nobody was expecting anything. Actually, a lot of the coaches after the D line went with Sean Cody and Patterson and all those guys. They started to go, but then I was throwing, and I don't think I might have missed one throw the entire day, but I was zipping around, and then they just started to converge on me, and I had all these scouts sitting around asking me, "Wait, who are you? What's your story?" I was like, I've yeah, because I mean, you 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 have the height. You were athlete, like again, mobile for your size and pretty mobile. And you always had a, like, I just remember every. I'd like to go out to practice practice early, and then you guys were out there. And every now and then, like, I'd catch balls for you guys. And Leinart threw a very catchable ball, yeah, mm -hmm. very soft. Yeah, but you just like even in warm ups, like you, it was like you were pitching, right? And yeah, boom. And so you always had like crazy arm strength. Yeah, I, and that was the thing is like I didn't think it was so much the physical part. It was just nobody. How are you supposed to know when yeah. you're in there as a backup quarterback? And so they started asking my story, and the next thing I know, I get calls from the Raiders, San Diego, oh, okay. Tennessee, all these teams to come and do a private workout. So Bengals. So I do these private workouts, and I get to talk, and we get to sit up on the board and like have an actual discussion. Like I know football. I physically can do it. I just haven't had the ability to. None of those teams were the Patriots, by the way. Yeah. And so then all of a sudden the draft comes around, and I thought, look, I just want an opportunity to go in to a camp and see if I can prove myself. Did you, th did you, did you think you were going to get drafted, or was it like, hey, like I just Hell no. yeah, I was going to say just give me a, like a like a, an actual UFA shot, like undrafted free agent, like just g to where. You give me a chance. Give get my foot in the door. Yeah. That's all I was envisioning for my, my. Ultimately, my goal was to say, "Hey, get into a camp, see if you can prove yourself enough to where they keep you around." Yeah, if, even if you're practice, give me a year to develop, and then I could be a backup, and then maybe over time. Maybe over time. And so, all of a sudden, the last day of draft, I go down. I mean, it was the morning time, and I get a call from Scott Pioli, and Scott Pioli, the um, player personnel guy at or the general manager at the Patriots, he calls me and said, hey, Matt, we're really interested in you coming in here, either as a free agent, but if we do take a quarterback late, we're going to take you in the draft. And I was like, wow, okay. That Big was the morning of the draft? Morning of oh, the last cool. day of the draft. And I was like, huh, mm. never never thought of that. So then we get to the seventh round, it go down with my agent, and we start taking free agent calls because we're getting close to the, end yeah. of the seventh round, mid-seventh round. And – my agent says somebody's on the phone for you. It's Coach Belichick. Matt, I just want to. Matt. Yeah, Matt. Uh, how are you? I just want to say congratulations. We're gonna take you next. And I was like, I, I said, are you effing with me? Like, and uh, he's like, uh, no, no, we're gonna take you next. So I run in. Lauren's sitting on the couch and she's reading a magazine. I was like, check this out. She's like, you haven't come up yet. And then all of a sudden she's like, I was like, watch. And then ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Name comes across. It was a. Unreal moment, Unreal surreal, moment. because yeah. never in a million years. And did you feel a little bit of validation for, for the, you know, the fortitude to push through and not quit and not give up or not transfer? A hundred percent. And I think I was more yeah. proud of myself for taking my own path mm -hmm. because so many people told me, dude, there's no chance. Like you're, you're not getting drafted. You're probably not even going to get a sniff because just the, the odds are without, with, never starting a game in college, mm -hmm. throwing 32 passes or whatever it was of all of college and mop-up duty, that the odds are so stacked against you that you shouldn't do it. And I just – I was proud of myself just for saying, you know what, I don't care what anybody else thinks right now, and I'm just going to go out and I'm going to see what I can do. And so it, that was gratifying for sure. And then to think that New England Patriots, who just came off – three Super Bowls in mm -hmm. four years was the team that drafted me. I was like, hell, this is amazing. Oh, it's a great opportunity. And and for reasons different than what actually ended up just because of the injury, like then learning under Belichick and Brady <clears throat> and probably getting some spot duty at the time, mm -hmm. you know, some backup duty, you could show yourself to, to get uh, signed into a second contract by another team. And I guess it kind of ended up that way in a different sense. But I remember – it was a story because it's like, man, even SC's backups get drafted. Like, and I'm sure the coaching staff use that for their recruiting. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, you come to SC, even if you don't start, you get drafted. You yeah. know. Yeah, I mean, but at the end of the day, I was just like sitting there going, pinching myself, going. There was a lot of those dark days that I went through, but that was one of those moments. Was like, 
man, I just got it, drafted. Made it all worth it. And yeah, yeah, and you get to get drafted is a dream for, for all of us. So you go to New England, and what was that like? Intimidating. Intimidating as hell, man. Was the first time you meet? Yeah. I, I want to each story. First time you meet Belichick in person, first time you meet Brady in person. Coach Belichick came in, spoke with the rookies. All right. It, I, when I actually met him in person, I think it was in the hallway. He was like saying hi yeah. as the rookies came uh-huh. in. Very dry. Yeah. Not much, right? And then you go into the team meeting and then you start to say, this is for real, right? Because from the moment you get in there, you know it's about your accountability. It's what you do on the field. It's your execution. Like he lays this thing out. And he, and he also, the other part that was one of those where I'm sitting there going, oh, I love this, was he said, I don't care where you're drafted. I don't care if you're a free agent or you're a first rounder. You make your own way here. Like you, you, you determine your own playing time. If you do what we need you to do and we think that you're the best possible player to get on the field. So I was like, Man, that just means I got to go to work. Mm-hmm. And then Brady came in after the, we had rookie camp and stuff. Brady came in. And my, I was the biggest nerd ever. I, I told, tell the story. He comes in. I said, "Hey, Mr. Brady, how are you? I'm Matt Castle." And he goes, "Don't call me Mr. Brady. Call me Tommy." I was like, "Man, I might get cut today." Yeah. <laughs> I was like, sit there just going, "Dude, that was the weakest yeah, introduction." I should have been like, Brady. "Hey, call, cast dog. Cast what's up, dog. Dude? What's, what's up?" up? So, I mean, it That's was one funny. of those, but then you're just kind of trying to figure it out. Like, and it's more so day in and day out. That's now what you do for a profession. It was much different being in the collegiate ranks where you're going to school, you're having all these balancing acts. These distractions. Yeah. yeah. There, that's your job. That's your profession. You, and, if you can give it as much or as little as you, you want. you like that? I loved it yeah. because I was like, this gives me an opportunity to just grind on what I need to grind. I'd go home, make notes, watch film, do. I'd spend as they didn't have any restrictions back then too, so I could spend as mm. much time at the facility as I want. So there was this like craving, desire, and this motivation inside of me to try to go out and do everything possible to put myself in a position to make this team because they were giving me an opportunity, which gave me hope. Was there ever a moment where you almost felt like mission accomplished? I remember. Coach Carroll said this about Mike Williams. Um, He went to the league with the Lions and then kind of failed out. Mm -hmm. And then he had a resurgence, actually, with the Seahawks. And somebody asked Pete, hey, why do you think he did well? He's like, well, why do you think he he didn't do well and now he's doing better? He's like, because he's like, I think with Mike and a lot of the players, their goal is to make the league. It's not necessarily to be successful. It's like, you know, my goal is to make the NFL. And then they make the NFL and they they hit their goal their whole life. Like, I just want to be in the NFL that they don't really think of like, well, how do I actually achieve success and stay in the NFL? Was there ever time where you're like, okay, I made it, I got drafted, like this would be great if it worked out, but I'm just happy? No, no, that was complete opposite for me. Like it wasn't just about getting there because I think that my experiences had calloused me at USC and I'd always be on that cusp. I always need to do a little bit more, always need to do that. And so – I always had that thing like I'm looking over my shoulder, got to outwork this guy. It was always about competition. It was always like, but I had a different perspective. Like I said, I went in there and my perspective now was like, yes, they drafted me, but this is, this is something that is different because Mm -hmm. they gave me this opportunity. So now I just got to get to work. It's like a second chance. It is. And it was refreshing because it was one of like, this team wants you. Yeah. Where it felt like the other, uh, other circumstance was like, you got put aside. Do you ever, I'm sure you have, have you ever run into Coach Carroll or Coach Norm Chow? And like, how, how is that? Well, it's interesting because I ran into Norm Chow one time, and this is after, I, I think it was my Pro Bowl season in, yeah. in Kansas City, and, and randomly ran into him at an airport. And he goes, Matthew, who would have thunk it? And I said, Coach, I did. Yeah, I did. I know you didn't, but I did. Yeah. It was a little bit awkward, but it was like then we Norm, caught up. But I was like, Norm was. Uh, I think he was a very intel- is a very intelligent uh, offensive coordinator. But yeah, the emo- I don't. There's a big emotional swing, on, especially on game day. Yeah, yeah, for sure, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. But that was my main interaction with him. But after I saw saw him like different, we're, we're definitely cordial. It's not like I, I hold any grudges what or about anything Pete? like that. Pete, I actually talked to him. Last week. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so Brennan Carroll, his son's up at Washington. We were covering his game on Peacock, so I called him just to, like, what do you think about Brennan now? We talked for, like, 25 minutes. He's yeah. giving me the history of the zone run scheme, yeah. right, with Alex Gibbs and, and all the Tom Gable. He's talking about San Francisco. He's like, you know, people are worried about me, Maddie. 
but they don't have to worry about Pete Carroll. I'm having a great time. I'm watching all the games. I'm going to my my grandson's game, this, that, and the other. And so he's the same Pete he's Carroll. He's selling you. He's selling himself. He probably misses it. He'll be yeah. back. I heard he was teaching at SC. Teaching he went there and did, he was telling me about that too. He went yeah. down there for, I think it was an entrepreneur class or something, something like, like that, that that he showed up to. All right. So you're learning. Um, was it your third year when Brady went down? My fourth year. Your fourth year. Is that a contract year for you? Contract year, absolutely. Okay. And so heading into the year, probably like, hey, I just need to get some garbage snaps and and just build a resume. And hopefully a team's like, hey, we think this guy can be the starter. But was it the first game of the year? First game of the year, first quarter of the year. What the hell? Like you're sitting there, you're like, no way. Dude, I'm telling you, for eight years, people have been telling me you're one snap away. I was like, okay, guys, yeah. I've been down this road before, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, and so... I remember watching the play. He throws the ball down the field to Randy. Like it was long, touchdown. No, long completion, but then he oh, gets okay. stripped. And they, but the, there's like this hush over the crowd. And I'm like, yeah. normally, like, the, you don't get a lot of quiet, quiet fans in that stadium. So then I'm watching, and then all of a sudden I look back, and Brady's on his back. And look, this guy is one of the toughest dudes I've ever been around. He okay. got crushed at times and always got up. Yeah. And so I'm sitting there, and then the medical staff goes out. I see him messing with their knee, but this is like hyper speed, right? Because now your adrenaline's starting to go. Like, then I see him. You're sitting there, like, off. oh man, if he's hurt, who goes in? Co yeah. Coach, where's my helmet? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they walk off, and Coach Belichick, as only Coach Belichick would do, super casual. Castle, get your helmet. You're going in. So I was like, oh, do 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 do. They get a stop defensively. They punt the ball down to our one yard line. This is my first time running out on the field. This is significant game, opening game of the season, packed house. And I just, like, there was this buzz in my ear. It's probably because my heart was beating and about to jump out of my chest. So I run on the field, and I'll never forget the stadium gets up. They start clapping, like, in support. I was like, they don't really mean that, but thank yeah. you for this. Wow, okay. So then we go back. We're, we're backed up. We run two plays, and I'll never forget. We ran jab 126, which is a play action. Z pop X prick backside. Well, Randy's our Z. Patrick Sertain is this corner for the Kansas City Chiefs, and he's a vet. Yeah, he's pretty good. So he jumps inside. Oh, and this is exactly where we're going to – like, you're supposed to come off and hit this, like, little skinny post. He jumps inside. Well, Randy's a savvy player. He just runs right by him down the side. And I come off the fake looking for there, and I just see Randy behind this guy. And I was like, oh, I throw it down the field somehow, some way. You know, somebody's looking over me, hits him for 55 yards to start the drive. And you said, I got this. And I was like, I can breathe again. Yeah. And then we went down and we scored, but it was a tight game, right? But it, it was one of those where I didn't have any time to think. I just went in and reacted. Probably better. Yeah. And it was a blessing because then the next week came on and it was like shitstorm, right? Every media outlet wanted yeah. to do an interview. You hear your story. Who are they bringing in to replace Brady? They, this kid has no experience. This, this is going to be a terrible year. And I just shut off all. It was kind of one of those weird circumstances because most of the time I'm watching with no repercussions, mm -hmm. right? Nobody's judging me. And now everybody. Back up quarterback, best job in the league. You know? Yeah, exactly. And then all of a sudden it's real. And I'm getting prepared to go down to the Jets. And we play in the Jets for our first game. And we're playing Favre. Favre was my childhood, I mean, excuse me, childhood yeah. hero. Right, I used to wear the Favre cleats, yeah. and I just remember the night before we got done with meetings, and my mom and uh, Lauren came out, my wife, and after the meetings, I just had to get away. Goes, and I went up to the room, and I just kind of hung with them for a little bit, and it gave me just that little grace period. Mm -hmm. And then woke up the next day, and it was rock and roll time, and we ended up going out and played well enough. It wasn't spectacular by any means, but we beat the Jets, and I never forget. Favre runs over. First guy to come see me after I take the kneel down with his big old hand, and he shakes my hand. And he says, with a big old grin, hey, I'm really happy for you, man. Congratulations. I was oh, like, that's nice. And that was like my. That was your moment. That was a moment. Like, that's uh, something I'll take with me for the rest of my life. It was yeah. the coolest experience. It's kind of a culmination of six, seven years of, of adversity, right? Yeah. And then to get in that locker room, dude. And that was the coolest part, too, was getting in that locker room. And Coach Belichick saying, you know, they said that you haven't started a game since you were in Pop Warner Castle, but yeah. 
you started a game today and you won and hand me the game ball and like everybody just erupts and Bel- I was just you like, know Belichick oh. Belichick you tell me but like he is he is who he is but he's actually got a wicked sense of humor unbelievable especially sense if you of get humor. him boozing you remember we were in you me we were in Maui for a Pro Bowl it must have been after when you were at the Chiefs and Belichick they had lost the AFC Championship so he was coaching the Pro Bowl and Welker was there <laughs> and me you Belichick and Welker got housed by the pool yeah that's and, what kind of what you did at that thing. yeah so belichick coached my dad for i think three years in cleveland <clears throat> so uh he was he was on one that day and like the jokes did not stop coming oh and he is sometimes it's like in team meetings it'll be the most dry sense of humor what he'll yeah. say but we almost i'm have, i'm sitting there no yeah. i start giggling and, but some people don't pick it up but yeah, i'm like yeah. that was actually really was funny joke. right because he's actually a really funny guy he's got a great sense of humor but again he led in a certain way, mm-hmm. right? And it was always you understood the line between player, coach. And he kept it that way because he had to be able to say, hey, look, I think that we can get better at this position. Even though you've been here for five, yeah, six well, years, we have, have a relationship. Yeah. Or trade you. Yeah. Trade you, let you go. He did it with Willie McGinnis. He did it with a guy like Mike Vrabel, yeah. Larry Izzo. You can go down the line. Yeah. And that's how – Tough decisions. Tough decisions had to be made. What was Brady like as a as a player and as a person? And you don't have to spill details, but, like, just, you know, how did he approach the game? And It's so – it was so incredible for me as a young quarterback. Like, it was a master class in how to play the position, how to be professional, how he attacked every day. Like, there's nobody that outworked him. Hmm. He wasn't the greatest athlete, but I'll tell you what, he worked harder than anybody. Will he, he take it? Will he take it personally that you said he wasn't the greatest athlete? No, I'll tell him to his face. <laughs> I was I'll say, tell him I definitely he, was a better athlete. He, uh, than you. Like like many he was my workout partner for three years. Like many of the greats, he also seems like a guy who holds on to like Jordan. You know, remember that uh, last dance? Like you could tell he just holds on to things as motivation. You know. Well, and that's the other part about him is he found any little thing slight, yeah, any slight, any disrespect, anything that would motivate him and he just needed that switch to turn on mm-hmm. and he always found it right and it it wasn't throughout season it was the off season when look i've won three super bowls i'm an mvp of the league he always found something to go motivate him and then then you get into these meeting rooms and the how he asked questions why he asked those questions the mi- most minute details i remember the night before games we go in and go through the call sheet of 130 plays three times then we go to the stadium, and he would say the play out loud. Say if they're in this coverage, we're going boom, boom, boom. They're in this coverage. I'm, if they blitz us here, I'm going to check to a seven man protection. This is what I'm signaling. I he mean, just knew. was just on yeah. it, man. And then, and so for me, it was it was so much fun to be around that. And then it's all the aspects, right? It's player, it's work ethic, it's professionalism, but then it's also leadership. And he knew how to interact with guys, right? He knew that. Wes Welker, you could MF. And he keep coming back like a Labrador puppy, like, what do you want me to do now? What do you want me to do now? Randy Moss, veteran guy, been around the league, has a strong personality. Hey, I'm not going to MF him in front mm-hmm. of people. That's a sign of disrespect to him. Yeah. But he understood that. So when they got in the locker room, hey, Randy, let me talk to you about this, that, and the other, and go through what it could be a route. Yeah, a high degree of emotional intelligence. Really? And then and then when he spoke to the team, you know, there, there are leaders out there that want to hear themselves, right? And they, they feel like they have to say something because – he spoke with purpose. Hmm. And so all these different lessons that I learned from him um, was amazing. And, th- and then a lot of people don't understand this. Brady's an incredible human hmm. off the field. He was always the first one to say, buy your dinner. He was always the first one to give out gifts to everybody. He was always loving to his family. Like, that's just the type of per- – but you see the celebrity. And you guys had a good prank. You guys had a good prank war going for a minute. Yes, we did have a good prank war going for a minute. Well, it went for a minute until Belichick squashed it. Like mm-hmm. it, it, it was, was getting out of hands. He took the tires off my car, dude, and put me on okay. blocks. And then that's when was I it, realized, don't, don't don't start no shit. Don't yeah, yeah. He said, "Don't." <laughs> you learned quickly. Don't mess with anybody that's got more money than you do. I was like, yeah, I, sure. he kept him for a week, dude. In the back, they had him put it up in like some lock. I was like, dude, I'm. that's good. That's you know, it's um, obviously in a professional setting, you can't take. You shouldn't tell those Matthews guys listening and gals don't take HR. Yeah, d- don't take tires off the rims of your coworkers. But um, we try and keep it loose. But that, that that's for me what I miss the most about the game was the camaraderie of the locker room and 
mm. how much you can get away with in a quote unquote professional setting. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's the biggest adjustment I think all of us have. Yes. Leaving the game. And then especially after 14 years, the other part is like those relationships, right? The, those bonds that you have with the boys. It's after the game, it's getting ready for competition. Mm -hmm. It's the shenanigans it's in the everything. locker room. Yeah, there's nothing. I mean, and outside of the there's, military, there's probably nothing like it. Right. I mean, it's just that brotherhood, and then that part is gone from gone. your day to day. Because I, you know, you look forward to going into the, you look forward to going into the practice and sitting there with well, your boys and shooting like the crap. Ninety percent of your time and, is just making fun of each other across yeah. all social boundaries. A hundred percent. That's not. That's not necessarily. There's something. nothing off limits. Let's just say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a. It's a unique environment to say the least. All right. So speaking of adjustments, mm -hmm. you you guys go eleven and five. Now you don't make the playoffs, which I think was like the best record not to make the playoffs. But you have a fantastic year. Mm -hmm. It's your contract year. Um, without spending too much time, I'm assuming there was um, there was multiple offers for your services, and uh, you ultimately settle with the Chiefs. And if I had to guess, um, adjustments of like generational wealth like how was that like i mean there's probably a lot of layers to it obviously a culmination of overcoming adversity uh confirmation of your belief in yourself but also a a very practical change in um financial anxiety for you know financial independence like what was that kind of period of time in your life life like it was uh unreal and like you said it was an adjustment because you're fighting for a job one minute you go out and perform and then it just so happened that actually bill franchised me he gave me the franchise tender i signed it and then i got he traded me to kansas city oh i didn't know that because brady was coming back from the acl that's right and a franchise is what was it the average of the top five. so even one year on a franchise as a quarterback you're probably not going to have to work again but yeah i mean it was a good good tag and then we yeah. got to use that as a negotiation chip with kansas city because uh, when they traded for me i was had under the one year franchise franchise we hadn't renegotiated a deal yet who's your agent Dave Dunn. Yeah. Yeah, right. athletes That's first. Right. So. A1, baby. Yeah, Brian Murphy and Dave Dunn. Yeah. So. Great agents, great quarterback agents. Yeah, so. great quarterback agents. Um, but, yeah, it was it was different, man, because it's – you never even – that when I went in and just tried to make the team, right, for New England and put myself out there, and then all of a sudden your world changes in one season, mm -hmm. really overnight. And now it's – now you're talking about this financial realm where I'm just hoping maybe next year some other team will pick me up for mm -hmm. league minimum. And now you're talking about a whole different layer to it. Yeah. And then the dynamic in the locker room changes because I was always that guy like, hey, what's the up? Fun, this like, yeah, I could still have fun. I'm the you could keep it super loose because like, you're like, look, I'm not going to play this week. I, yeah. can, I could do some pranks or whatever. Right. But now it's like, oh, gosh, everybody's looking to me. Yeah, but with that price tag comes a lot more responsibility. And the way that you're even viewed in the locker yeah. room is much different or at least it felt different early on then you go to a new team and you're now seen as the guy that's you're, gonna, you're literally the franchise guy yeah you're the franchise guy and you're seen you got to bring immediate success to this franchise yeah. that had struggled for a few years well i was going to say how did you how did you adjust to that new role and like imagine the audience is listening and they don't have to be a professional football player to know you get some big promotion you know you're on a team now you're managing the team or you're like heading a division like how did you approach going from one of the guys to be like, oh, I actually have to lead in a way that, you know, to a degree you hadn't since high school, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and to where you're like, you're the starting quarterback. Right. I, I think part of it too was you're coming to a new locker room. You don't know these guys. Mm. You've got to earn their trust. A lot of times in football or any competitive sport, you've got to earn it by what you do and how you perform. And so I knew that like coming in, building relationships throughout the off season, doing all that stuff, that was all new. Then also you have your family dynamic of changing towns, new city. Then you also go form an organization with coaches that were so structured and you had such a modified plan that everything was familiar. Now it's so unfamiliar. Chan Gailey's my new offensive coordinator. Todd Haley's my new coach. All new players around you. Financially, it's a different world on the outside looking in, right? And so there was a huge adjustment period for me that year to kind of get my bearings and understand what who What year was this? This was 2009. It was a good year to get a bunch of money. Anything you invested in 2009 was going to go up from there. Yeah, exactly. When the world was <laughs> falling, right. I remember I, sitting I, in that locker room and all these guys were like, oh, my God. Like yeah. stock market. And losing everything. everything. Oh, losing everything. Yeah. My brother got drafted in 2009. I always like, if you got drafted in 2006, like, 
half of what you invest in. A lot of your portfolio yeah. is gone. I know, but yeah. uh, so um, let me let me touch on uh, personal life. So um, you married Lauren, your college sweetheart, who was a volleyball player. I remember her from SC. Yep. Like we would all work out in the same spot. But um, did you guys have kids by the time you moved to Kansas City? No, we actually. She got pregnant our first year in Kansas okay, City. Okay, because you, you have five now. So. We have five now. We, you know what? Yeah. We we had a litter. Yeah. We just had a litter and knocked <laughs> it out real quick. Um, no, we uh, we got to Kansas City, and she got pregnant my first season. Had Quinn, our oldest daughter, going into my second season. Okay, because I was going to ask, like, did they have to take the kids out? But that wasn't that wasn't. Uh, that added like, a whole other element to yeah. it too. When you start having kids and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I know it. Um, I grew up. Uh, I think my dad played till I was 16. That's unbelievable. Yeah, I moved uh, 30, 31 times, I think. A lot of times back and forth, so that was actually, I enjoyed it. But, yeah, it's 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 unique growing up as a kid of a yeah. of an athlete in the NFL. Mm-hmm. But um, so you start having kids uh, in Kansas City, but now you're also the starting quarterback, to your point. Like, you're leading the team. Like, what was that like? You know, I, I think that there's a lot of different dynamics that go into it. Some of it was me fighting the system, right? And I know that you shouldn't, but I was taught in such a regimented way of how to see the field, why we do certain things, why these checks are in place. And so when you went out on the field, it was just it was very calculated, and everything hmm. everything had an answer. And you're talking about comparing New England to now Kansas City. Right, when I first got there. Right. Okay. So it's a brand-new system, right? And some of the how how one coach sees it, they would see it completely different, right? When we're coming from a new system, so I would have to fight that system a little because mm. it took every part of me to create that buy. And I think that's probably some of the struggles that happened early on was because I didn't have you didn't have full buy in because I was fighting the fact that I was taught something and it was polar opposite of and what you were taught were, was working very well at the exactly time. So and i had like, success in. well here's in what it. we did in new england and oh by the way we win all the time mm-hmm. and so th- that was a challenge and then it, at one point i s- just said look you got to stop doing that because i think you're hindering your growth yeah. and limiting your ability to get the best out of this offense because somehow some way you can make this work there's different ways to skin a cat right yeah. and so I started to buy in, and we had more success near the closer to the end. But it was that next year, and we also had a change in um, our offensive coordinator. Even though Chan was, got fired a week before season, by the way, uh, that that didn't help. No, anything. that never does. Yeah, right before my first season, so that didn't help anything. But Charlie Weiss comes in, came from the same background, yeah. New England system. Yeah. That year we go ten and five. Easily could have been eleven and five or twelve and or eleven and yeah, eleven and five or whatever it was. So we go to playoffs. I go to the Pro Bowl something to be said about familiarity in terms of system and what you do. And so, but that was a big year for me because again, we come off a year where we win four games we're still in the struggle bus. Kansas City's saying what, you know, you invest in this guy, you invest in that. And mm-hmm. you know, all of a sudden the next thing you know, you come in and that again, that brought on a whole different world of adversity that I hadn't experienced being the front man. There's some lonely days where you don't want to go outside your house because you don't want people talking smack to you or yeah. looking at you and judging you. And so that was a that's a whole new part of this thing that was the adversity that I had to overcome that was so completely different than what I did at USC, right? It was like now it was the media's on you. Mm-hmm. You know, now you're this and that. You go mm-hmm. out and people are judging you. And so I was like, you open the paper and there's an article, like, you know. Yeah, like, it's just like you have to, because you're, you're now the leader of this. And if the ship goes down, guess who is the guy that's the front man? It's going to be you. So then to come back the next day, and I remember that off season, I, I put um, PB 2010 on, on my uh, goals that year, mm-hmm. Pro Bowl 2010. Mm-hmm. And I just I, – I would write it on my shirt, on the inside of my shirt, and that's kind of was – that was my goal. And I worked my ass off that offseason. I felt like I was in great shape, was ready to roll, buy-in, and just the way that the season unfolded. It wasn't perfect by any means, but we had a pretty good team. We had some pieces to the puzzle, and we went out and won a bunch of games. I think we went 10-6 and six that season. Lost in the playoffs, but then I got a call from Coach Belichick, who was coaching, and said, hey – 
you're my you're my final guy on the Pro Bowl roster. And I was like, this is this oh, is awesome. so cool. Yeah. So and it kind of validated. It sounds like it validated almost like not that it was a culmination of your career, but somewhat in a sense it it kind of was a culmination of your journey of like hey find something else to find another profession to hey i got drafted i'm in the league screw you oh hey i actually got a contract and i'm a starter and now it's like actually i'm a high performing starter yeah. to the pro bowl right and it was a journey all right and i can't tell you how anybody else could like how you get to that point because i thought there was no like i said the probabilities are pretty slim mm -hmm. but it was just you know, somebody's looking out for me, but it also just goes back to putting your head down and trying to figure it out and grind it away. So you had a really good run in Kansas City for a while, and then um, I'm going to circle back to a statement. Is And then eventually towards the end of you, because you had a long career, towards the end you're backup for a couple – is backup quarterback the best job in the NFL? It's a pr it's an unbelievable job. Don't get me wrong, especially when the starting quarterback stays healthy, right? Yeah. Uh, unless you're trying to set yourself up for another quarterback because you want to play. No, because early in the career, you're but like, it, no, I want to play. Yeah, but but yeah. it's such a stressful job in the league because you yeah. never know. Because I think that there was only one team where I went as a backup where I didn't start in games, right? Or oh, somebody God. get injured or I was going to say up. Vikings, Bills, Cowboys, Titans, Lions. Yeah, well, the Bills. So I got traded from the Vikings to the Bills after my injury. Then I got traded that same year to Dallas Cowboys in week two. So I think it was week two, or right after week two or week three. So those two right there happened really simultaneously. Okay. Like it was one year, but it was Bills, Bills and Cowboys in the same year. Um, but what was I just saying anyway? What are you saying? You. You're saying like even though you're backup, you actually started almost every season. Like yeah, started and game, so what, what so. I'm saying is I like there's a stress component to being yeah. a backup because you could be in the middle of a game. You're kind of sitting there, and you always say, be ready, right? And you're, you are, but then all of a sudden that moment hits, and you're like the adrenaline rush and just not getting the reps throughout. You could go seven weeks without getting a mm -hmm. first team rep, and you're, you know. But you have to prepare. Like, that's probably frustrating because you're like, wait a minute, I, I have to prepare to some degree, you know. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't want to look like a clown, no. right? And you know that that's your job, and you've been doing it long enough, and you've played enough football to know if I don't prepare, then especially the mental side of the game, then I'm not going to be ready when it comes out. I'm going to look like an idiot, and that's the last thing I want to do is go look. And I'm not saying that every one of the times I went in, it, it was like, ah, pick up where we left off, mm -hmm. make all the throws. You're going to make some probably more physical errors when you step into those situations. It's rust. Yeah, it's rust. You're not in the it's flow. feel of the yeah. game. It's rhythm. It's big Everything. guys running yeah. at you that you haven't been hitting yeah. in a long time. It's all those different things adjustment. that come in. Yeah. And so you 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 played for the Titans for two, three seasons. Is that how you ended up in Tennessee here in Nashville? That's exactly it. Like when we got Lauren's here. it's like no more moving. Yeah. It, well, it also checks so many boxes for us, right? Yeah. Uh, the kids were just kind of starting elementary school mm -hmm. and stuff like that and had good schools, good mm -hmm. values, mm -hmm. you know, um, youth sports, all the different things that you Chats want. Chatsworth's changed a little bit. Chatsworth's changed a little bit. Chatsworth's changed a little bit. But when we got here, we're like, well, let's let's try the three three to five year deal. See mm -hmm. if we love it because we always still had that opportunity if we wanted to with sure. the kids being young enough to leave. I remember you were building. Uh, my kids were going to American Martyrs in Manhattan Beach. I think you guys were like building a home. We had well, that was the funny part. We you still guys have were registered. Home. We still have yeah, you we were registered because yeah. we were thinking because the principal was like, hey, by the way, I think somebody who played with Kyle is coming here. I was like, who's Matt Castle? I was like, yeah. My wife's like, yeah, yeah, for sure. And yeah. so I was like, oh, Cast Dog's moving in the so neighborhood. So we registered, and then all of a sudden we're like, well, we got to give this an opportunity. Yeah. So the kids stayed in school uh, there, and since that point, it's been a what eight eight years now since we got uh, here. Dude, this guy's changed my life. I don't. You probably know this. You're part of the reason I'm out here. Why? Great question. So I was thinking we were like, okay, we're gonna move from LA, and we were like looking at Texas, like because that's what people right. in LA do. You Texas, Texas, Tennessee. And I just, I just didn't like. It just didn't. You know, we didn't fall in love, right? right. You know, we went to Dallas, Austin, Houston. We're just like, ah, you know, it just, just hadn't, you know, we were looking at schools and looking at homes. And my wife and I, like, man, it's like we like Texas. We just didn't love it. And my uncle Bruce, who played for the Oilers and the Titans for years, right. like he's Mr. Texas, but he's like, hey, before you shut it down, you got to go visit Nashville. Yeah. I said, Nashville, okay. Like I'd been out here to watch some of his games. I always enjoyed it. I'd been out here for work a couple of times. And, and um, he had just said this. And then, Lemos is down in LA. I took him to like a Lakers Golden State game and we we're hanging out and you know, we were talking about 
I was like, yeah, I'm thinking about moving, but Texas. And he's like, yeah. And I was like, but you know, my, my uncle, he recommended Nashville. He's like, you know, cast dogs in Nashville. Yeah. Like, Is he? He's like, yeah, he, they love it. Yeah. And I called you. I yeah, was like, I remember having that conversation. Yeah, I was like, like you're asking about Nashville. I was like, how do you like it? And you were like, dude, we love it. And so um, that just, it just, it was another layer of like, okay, like there seems to be something. And then we, we, we made multiple trips out here and said, yeah, this feels right. And it, and now look, your whole entire family's here. Whole and, well, yeah, it was, you know that was unexpected. I I moved away from them. You know, <laughs> and then, like, and then we got to be followed. near. Them. No, <laughs> that was that was the hardest part, as I'm sure with you is. Yeah. We would, you know, it's kind of like that T chart where you, it's like choosing a college. Like yeah. you, you rate everything, and you know, Tennessee, outside of weather, right? Um, but Tennessee had a lot of advantages over California for what we were yeah. looking for. But the family was the tough part. But we were just like, look, we got to do what's best for for what we believe is best for our children. That's it. And, you know, work travels easier from Tennessee because you're more central to the U.S. and the company had gotten real big. But, um, but yeah, having Clay and then Casey and my dad was out here the last couple of days. We're working awesome. on him and him and um, my mom to get a, a second place. So we're slowly bringing yeah. them over. But, yeah, Tennessee's great. So you guys are, you're, you're, you're Tennessee. You're all we're in. We're Tennessee. We're all in, man. I don't see a change in anything. You're still soon. driving that big, like, Sprinter van? Well, we still have one for sure. Uh, we, we need one. Five kids. Anytime anybody wants to bring it. You How know, we, your I, oldest? I don't. Oh, dude, she started ninth grade this year. I was going to say, like, pretty soon if she could drive. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. It is wild to think that we're already at that stage. Every now and then I'll drive by your house if I'm coming up from the south. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to prank this guy. when I'm going to take the wheels off his car or something. Tell him it was Brady. Perfect. But, all right. So d- last thing. Your your life, in addition, outside of your your wife and kids, has been football for so long. You know, going back to you know going to the college and the NFL, tremendous success. And then one day it's like, hey, it's gone. Even though you had a long career, it wasn't necessarily ripped away from you. You know, right. the way it is, a lot of people feel like, man, I had more in me. Yeah. What's the transition like to being a full time NFL uh, star in many ways, but regardless player, to mm-hmm. just like, what do I do now? Yeah, it's a difficult transition. There's yeah. no doubt. You you talk about the dynamic in the locker room. This is one component, but then it's the structure, structure. right? The, you take for granted like, oh, well, I got to be there at this time. I know, I know the and meetings. everybody structures it for you, right? And that's what I'm saying. Yeah, there's not a lot of thinking that goes on even during the off season. You know that you got to get your workout in this, and then once you get back to OTAs and all that stuff, it's lined up for mm-hmm. you. So I think for a lot of people that play for such a long period of time. The component of the locker room is itself, but the real difficulty is lack of structure. Lack of structure and figuring that out on a daily basis. And then also, a lot of guys, you know, they've got to create purpose because a lot of us come out of this realm of playing this one sport that you've dedicated to because you have to dedicate 100% of your attention to it, or guess what? You're going to be out of league, right? But then transitioning into a new world and understand that that was who you were. But I have to reinvent myself now mm-hmm. to become something that I want to be now. And how long did that take you? You know, I think part of the reason I got into media so quickly was because I was struggling with the fact of not knowing exactly what direction and mm-hmm. wanting to figure it out because I needed purpose. I needed a, I needed to create structure. I needed to create organization. And so I got a call from uh, NBC Sports Boston to do Patriot stuff and do their pregame and stuff. And so I was like, Yes, I'll do it. I'll, you know what? I haven't done it before, but I'm going to go do it for the simple fact that I need purpose and I need direction. I need something to accomplish on a daily basis, whether mm-hmm. it was watching film, doing their podcast, whatever it might be. And that helped with the transition for sure. But then football season's also six months out of the year. So you got to find other passions that you want to help out with, whether it's I'm on the school board or do stuff. Are yeah, you? yeah, I'm like, so oh, I mean, funny. I got asked to be. I'm sure they're regretting that decision now, but at the same time, it's one of those where you've got to find other niches. And that also allowed me to figure out is this something that I want to do? Is it something I want to pursue long term? Or, you know, you also have the ability and have given yourself the ability to look in different avenues, whether it's investment, whether it's some other job market or whatever it might be how would you how would you describe yourself as a as a professional um or i guess 
how would a coach describe you if you if you had to whether it's Belichick or Carroll or whoever you know whoever your coaches were you know as it related to your approach to your profession I think that they would all say that I was dedicated right and I was dedicated I was committed and I, I I also believe that they'd say I was a team player I was one of those guys that came in came to work enjoyed what I did wanted wanted to do best but if for some reason we had a young guy that I knew I was going to be the bridge guy which happened multiple times later in my career I wasn't going to be an asshole to the guy mm. I was going to say you know what I'm going to help this kid be the best he can be if we're competing we're competing that doesn't mean that I have to not help groom this guy because at some point can answer his question yeah yeah at some point he's going to be a guy that hopefully says Hey, Cass really helped me with this and, and sure. showed me how to be a professional because when I came in the league, that's exactly what Tom Brady did for me. He took me under his wing. We worked out together. I watched him. I could ask stupid questions that I he knows the answer to that I don't. But I always had enough respect for the game and for the guys that I played with previously to see that type of leadership that I always wanted to be that kind of teammate, that kind of guy, mm -hmm. and impress on those younger guys to help them achieve what they wanted to achieve. And what, what advice would you have for any pro professional across all industries who, and I'm kind of trying to place them in, in, it almost seems the theme of your career in terms of like where they, they just got passed up for a promotion, right? Mm -hmm. Or they've been, uh, they, they haven't got to where they either feel or want to get to in life for whatever reason. What advice would you have for them, you know, kind of drawing on your experience? Yeah, it's a great question. It really is because I've been through a lot of different adversities. Then all of a sudden I have success. And then I go back to having some more adversities, whatever it might be. And I think at the end of the day, it's all about your approach and your mindset because it's easy to just say, well, F you, do that. And you're going to go through that. And you have to go through sometimes that process to get to the point to say, all right, I'm ready to go. But the quicker that you can turn that switch and refocus yourself and your attention, your energy to achieving something that you want to achieve instead of feeling sorry for yourself, because it's so easy to go down in a different direction and sit there and be like, like you said, blame other people. It's them. It's not me. That's bullshit. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes circumstantially, 100 percent, I'll sit there and tell you I've said that same thing before. But at the end of the day, it does nothing good for you to get to your ultimate goal. It doesn't get you closer. It doesn't get sure. you closer. And if your in line is here, then you have to sometimes evaluate yourself. And that's sometimes the hardest thing to do. I had to sometimes look at myself and say, why? Why do I why am I struggling right now? Why are they overlooking me? And you can come up with every excuse in your mind, but find something that you say, you know what? Maybe I'm doing something wrong. How can I change something that I'm doing now? to make me more successful in what I want to achieve here. And being intros introspective, I mean, I think that that's a big part of being successful in understanding that when adversity hits, it's a short period of time. Now we've got to, you know, man up and figure out, or man up, woman up, whatever it might be, and go out and do what we need to do to achieve. Outside of a specific mentor or coach, like a resource as a human that you can't like give to everyone, was there a, was there a, a resource that you leaned in or you used whether it was a book whether it was a something that maybe helped you in terms of your perspective or overcoming this adversity there was and i'm trying to think of the book right now it was a great book but it was actually it was a sports psychology book and i was struggling from that first year to second year like i said the transition from going from this unknown backup to having this you know miracle season whatever they want to call mm -hmm. it to now being the front front man and the, the the, organization, the, the yeah. man for the organization, right? The franchise quarterback and going through those first struggles and feeling the pressure of and the weight of that yeah. was different. And so um, I read this book and I just, it captivated me. It was about mindset, right? It was about how you view yourself. Do you view yourself, they use the example of animals. Do you view yourself as a deer that runs flight, fight or flight type deal? Or do you just describe yourself as like a lion, mm -hmm. I'm going to be like this attacking personality. And then it also was talking about, look, there's going to be tough days, but would you, when you're out there on the field, it's the mindset of, 
Uh, I've got this fear of failure. I don't want to put myself out there, you know, and versus saying, I love this opportunity, right? Yeah. And it, it's, I love the opportunity to go out to compete at this high level, not being like, oh gosh, I hope I don't mess up. And so it's that old saying, like advancements comes through adversity, but embracing that adversity is just part of your story and saying, you know, create that mindset of just gratitude that you get to be where you are. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That, and some of that's perspective, but <clears throat> for, for what I, for myself is you always have that fear of failure to this day. But I, as I got older, I think kind of in line with what you were saying is the actual, the, the opportunity for something great, and the excitement, like kind of the, the possibility that actually started to overcome the fear of failure. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was younger, it was just like, well, what if I mess up? And you're, you, you didn't think about, well, what if I do something great? But right. as you get older, partly through messing up and realizing your life doesn't end, it's yeah. like, well, that sucked. The next morning, it still kind of hurts, but it, eventually the pain fades. But like the opportunity to do something great starts to override this fear of failure. A, a, a book, you know, Pete used to always recommend uh, the inner game of tennis. I oh yeah, know, I've know, read it before. Yeah. For so sure. that was a that was a big mindset book. But well, I, I really appreciate you sitting down. This has been fun. Um, I'm I'm gonna I'm text Limo. Okay, Matt, I'll get, I'll text Cast him. Dog. I'll tell him, dude, I'm gonna come smash you right now. <laughs> yeah, we got. <laughs> I've we got, got my yellow jersey on. We got to get him out to Nashville. Get him a. <laughs> Get a, get a oh, couple he'll, cocktails in him. He he would be great on Broadway. No, it's awesome. Congratulations on all your success and overcoming adversity. And the this, the uh, the broadcasting gig sounds fun, but um, it's fun. We'll but to, look at what you're doing, man. This is incredible. Nah, it's all good. What we, you built. We got to get now. We got to get my brother out of the house and uh, yeah, have a couple of drinks and we can. Mess. He said, "Hey, he appreciates you taking that sack in 2015." He said, I, I he actually said he, would have preferred he, that it didn't happen. He said he knows you could have thrown it away, but you looked and you said, you know, Clay's Clay's got a similar story overcoming yeah. that adversity. Come here, buddy, hit me right I, in my ribs. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Did he hit you in the ribs? Oh, he crushed me, knocked the breath right out of me. Really? Yeah, I, I, I told you that story. Our running back yeah. was supposed to pick him up, and I see him peripheral, and like coming. I'm like, he he's still there. Where when yeah, he the... gets a little bit closer, and he had a full head start because he lined him up off the ball. Did he? waylaid me. <laughs> I was like, oh, Clay, I hate you. Uh, you didn't give him the satisfaction at the time, did you? You got to be like, that didn't hurt. Uh, I tried to. I was like, <sighs> yeah. Anyway, well, uh, he appreciates beautiful. that. But yeah. I appreciate you coming on, Matt. It's great hanging. Always great, man. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, you got it. <laughs>